Consider this family business. Family business. Oh, they're on! They jump right in his head! They found who they need! That's a big shot down! He oh, has himself oh, back in! They want it! Oh. Kisley's not here, but what was that? It's a pentacam! Going no one for one in the shirt fight, and slams into the wall to actually go to Olaf. There's the access shot! And he just the up the jump! Good evening to all you League of Legends lovers out there and welcome to LCO Split 2 Day 2. I'm joined by the exact same people you would have seen yesterday. I got Tally, Skimmy, Rusty. Hi. 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 Can't say the, long time no see yeah, again, can say, we? We did the exact same thing yesterday. It wasn't funny then and it's still not Your funny now. Your said hi, to be fair. So yeah. I feel like we we hit the beat My notes there. literally go bumper hi. Yeah. Hi. 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 Here we are. G'day. Oh, mate. You want to know the next, next thing week. that I have on my... Oh. What's, next? What's next? Ne what next? Next is you a recap a video. We're going to have a look at what happened yesterday. One. Lost their match. Now it's up against Peace. Split to your first X can also add to history in that regard Well, speaking as well. of... This first blood. History being made here. Oh, and I went to Draven. 50 seconds in, Draven is going to get first blood. Chevy's a flare. Where I hit it? it. Yeah, hit the sky is blue, guys. Where's the Slender Man? Uh oh, there he is! Ah, <laughs> oh, surprise! There's two members lost him, Flay's dead! And explosions here ahead at the same time as well. I mean, god damn. <laughs> so funny. Hit. They start found Chaz. Live waiting patiently in jump seat. Oh, he's deep, he's dead. Didn't get a chance to use the ultimate. No flash, no ignite. Hot's found onto Predator. Instant claims away. Barrel is dead. Daystar looking for that moment right now. Flashed again. Looking to try and pounce and find his target. Zonus is removed. The call of the Forge got already burned. Daystar goes gold and lamps the fight. Still waiting to try and be utilized. But they run out of it, Rusty. It is an act. Yeah. And to add Why insult not? to injury, they'll Why use not? their hex gate to get out of the base. Is he going to live? He certainly is. Angry PM. Oh, the, the damage. Lemus. Moonlight Vigil doesn't matter, but Lemus is getting excited. He's done that first kill. Chaz with the wild growth in his head. Daystar is godlike. We all knew it. We've all seen it. And there is the double. Lemus now saying, get this game over with. I've got things to do, place to be, and aces to acquire. And on the back of one of the greediest bids from White. That was a pretty memorable moment. Uh, there, especially that first blood, 55 seconds. Did we ever end up checking tally? Is that was that a record? Oh, we didn't actually we did. check. We didn't actually we didn't check, actually did we? No. Guys, I sent you home with one checked. piece of we homework. Had one job. We had one, one job. Literally one job. It's, it's nothing else. Was just to fact check a record. I can't believe it. I was listening to that back, and all I can, all I really took from that is I said why not's name so much. Why not? And why it's, not? It's one of those. Why it's not? one of those names. Once you start saying it, you can't stop. Because it's just a break. Why not? It's, it's an issue. Yeah. <laughs> it's like nobody who used to play. It happens when they're not even playing. And then people are like, why? but he's not in the next game. I'm like, yeah, but, but why not? <laughs> oh, okay, English language sucks. <laughs> English language sucks. Yeah. It was yesterday. We saw four teams play. Uh, we've got that recap of it. But we can also just check out the standings. See what's going on there because we'll look. Like we said, new format with best of twos happening. If you do get a 2-0 over your opponent, you are going to get that three points. That's a lot of points for the team and uh, Team Bliss and the Chiefs obviously did get those 2-0s over their respective opponents of Vertex and Dire Wolves who don't have any points at the moment. But it's okay because neither do the other four teams down there. But to be fair, that's because we have not seen them play just yet, Rusty. Yes, there is definitely room for them to get points uh, yeah. today in the LCO as they are playing and the losing teams are not. Mm -hmm. uh, so the standings will definitely be changing after today. And of course, you can see the matches that are going to be happening on your screen in Nat's order. Kangaroo and Ground Zero. Closing out our day. Closing out our day. The only reason why I normally start with it is because I like to talk about our matchup that we're going to see first a little bit more in depth. Uh, there's a lot of things to be talked about. But yeah, Pendant uh, up against Mammoth Esports to start off our day. Then King Esports and Ground Zero Gaming to close it out. Uh, 
Do you think either of them are going to be schlackings like we saw Chiefs have yesterday, Tally? No, I think I think both these series will be relatively close. I'm really excited for the first matchup because I think that PG has to prove to like Listen Chiefs that they're also a top dog. Yeah. Like they had expectations last, but they didn't hit. So coming back now, let's see if they can hit that. And Mammoth has finally like put together a like I'd say a pretty good roster, and mm -hmm. I think that they it is their time to prove that like we're here to play. 100%, yeah. I mean, lots to look forward to from this Mammoth squad, and I am excited to watch this first match just as much as you. Yeah. Uh, and for the second match, very similar storyline, seeing how they've improved with all this time that they've had off between splits. Yeah. Thanks, thanks Kimmy. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate that. I'm input. Keanu Reeves. I only get paid to say, like, one word every 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's contract. He literally put in a clause. We'll not say more than one one word a minute. Yeah, yeah perfect. That's, yeah. He's got to bank them all yeah. up yeah. for when we're casting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yesterday we saw, stop it, yesterday we saw Nico coming out uh, in O's for the first time in a very long time tally. Yeah, I mean, look, there I am. I think, hey, one of them. Hey, I think that Nico's in a really, really good spot right now. The fact that you can play like three lanes, maybe even five if you're that crazy. But I think that she, the fact that she is so good in the meta and she has so many like little niche things that you have to think about in pro play, like you have to count minions, you have to like pay attention to last plants, young camps, like a lot of things that you haven't traditionally done as a pro player, you have to start doing. It kind of takes you out of the, the moment, you know? I think we were also talking about like the fact that it has been such a long time, three years since it was last yeah. played. We were looking actually at the builds that were used back in the day, right? With the water sprinkler item, we had the spooky ghost that would chase after somebody to try and find you. So <laughs> I, I can't we haven't said a single real name. <laughs> yeah, so I just was just like, oh, everyone, yeah, no. knows. GLP everyone knows. GLP 800. Yeah, okay, fair enough. Was it mate. Twin Shadows? Yeah, it was Twin, twin shadows? shadows, yeah. But the Shadows would go Spooky out and be like, ghosts. ooh, where are you? I'm coming for you. Woo, 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 woo. And you'd be like, ah, run away. And Nico would be like, shadows. surprise. And then bam. But now she's like, woo, I'm coming for you. I'm a plant. Surprise. I'm a plant. All of a sudden, I get two men. Two, two it's champion all just the game. Same. Yeah, it yeah. really is. Just uh, different things that you have to think about a little bit there. Well, what were uh, the most notable builds? Yesterday on Nico Tally, do you think it's stock standard with the Nikos we're seeing around? I think it's really stock standard. Okay. Like maybe you could see like a Nashes in jungle for like just jungle clear speed or like uh, something untraditional. But I think mm -hmm. like just normal Pro Devel and Rod of Ages is really standard for Nico. But the thing is, we did see both a Rod of Ages and a Proto Belt, right? Yeah. So there is still situations to build either where a lot of champions in League you have no choice but the one Mythic. Uh, and, you know, I think that's one cool thing that makes Nico flexible in multiple ways, right? It's not just that it could be five rolls if teams get crazy. You also can play as like a second carry if you've got that AP Gragas top lane or if you need to be a frontliner with the Rod of Ages instead yeah. of engaging. With this patch with the 13.10 that we're on, there's a lot of talk about the flexibility of champions, where they're going to go, what builds they're going to have. And there's still a lot left to be explored. Rust, I know you've been... Yeah. You've been on the back end, <laughs> having some ideas about some of these champions. You want to let them cook. You want to see what they've got to come up with, how you can experiment well, with Before them. I start cooking, <laughs> who wants to talk about Samira? Because this is uh, the most not, like, yeah. this is the most standard. Uh, this is the one that Rusty actually doesn't want to cook, guys. Like, <laughs> it's way too standard. I got me. so excited about when I saw about it, because the fact is, with Samira, you know, she jumps in, she gets excited, hits the S ranking, right, S tier, just spin to win, absolute, <laughs> you know, you're just destroying everybody. But the core interaction is that Dustblade was changed, and so now it's passive, does more damage based on how low the HP of the target is. Uh, you then got the Collector being buffed for more Lethality, so you get those two items together, 36 Lethality, you're doing a lot of true damage, basically, to very squishy targets. Uh, not to forget the fact that if you do get that one kill, you get that reset, you become invulnerable, as opposed to becoming, what, in Invisible. stealth, as it was before. Yeah. Mm. Um, so you're just ulting, get a reset, they can't touch you, they can see you, so they're angry, they're, they're smashing they're their They're waving the high, they're like, hey. They're like, oh, that's cool. <laughs> like a schoolyard bully, but you can't do anything about it because you're just too small. And then, yeah, it just, it's just carnage. I don't think it's a build you would go all the time. I think you could still definitely uh, make an argument for like the Infinity Edge, just raw damage in that regard. But I think it definitely has a place. And I know it's a handful of players. I think it's only, I think Samira's only ever been played like eight times in O's history. It's a very niche champion wow, in that yeah, regard. Okay. But people that would come to mind would be like Voice, Praedif, um, Aiko, formerly Hooper. I think there's definitely a world in which they could look to try and utilize that on this patch. Awesome. You wanna go next, Tally? Yeah, uh, I think the two main ones that I would wanna hit are like, Ash and Corky, because I think that like these are slept on. Like AD carries and Ash is also like a support flex. I think that Corky with the new Triforce buffs and also Ash can be in a like they're both in a really good spot. I think that like going imp uh, Imperial Mandate, the Echoes of Helion Ash as a support. We all know how annoying that was when she's just spamming arrows like all over the map. Now she has a bit more utility, mm -hmm. which is pretty good for that. And I think that like Corky, traditionally like you would build Ludens and you would be kind of useless until two items. You, you would scale extremely well, but you would just not have presence in the early game. 
but now that he has Triforce again, he has a bit more strength in the early game, which will probably like cover up a lot of like why you would not want to pick Corky before. Because you can auto attack again. Yes. So Corky suddenly <laughs> is more than just throwing rockets at yeah. people, yeah. Um, to echo what Tally said, a part of the reason that we're cooking up a lot of these builds is Echoes of Helia that he's just mentioned. Uh, you combo that. So Trinity Force right now is probably going to be the meta-defining item uh, for, for the moment, unless it gets touched. So things like Corky will start to exist. But Swain, Ash, I will throw out... I played Olaf in an ARAMS with this build. Uh, <laughs> Echoes, meta. Oh, God. Echoes of Helia, Imperial Mandate, and Font of Life as a combo of three things make every champion a support champion mm. as long as you have like slows that you can apply. So Swain gets to build Imperial Mandate and Echoes of Helia because he builds Rylai's and has permanent slows that people can proc Font of Life on. And because it's a support item that gives you ability haste, also lets you deal damage if you're damaging mm -hmm. people, it just kind of adds onto each other and it's all cheap. So I would encourage everyone at home, maybe not in ranked, uh, to, to con continue to find these other champions, right? Because the first thing that comes to my mind, and I'm a giant cheese lord in, in League, is Trundle. Uh, like Trundle support can do all of these things, right? Can slow people down, run font of life, run support builds, and be very annoying to deal with. So things like that, the list may grow beyond what we're currently seeing on the screen. Mm -hmm. As time develops, we'll definitely see that list grow. Uh, look, that could maybe be another from the fans segment on another day because we've already got our uh, from the fans today. If you guys want, uh, who are you most excited to see returned? Uh, and you can send us a tweet using hashtag LCO and you can show you can show up on the broadcast. That's one way you can ensure that, you know, you're getting a little bit of limelight. We have one fan here. The wonderful people from the on-air talent, they make the broadcast fun and entertaining. Also by Panther because he's the LCO smile. That's true. I actually, I cannot argue with a single... True real based. <laughs> true real based? <laughs> real perfect trifecta. Yeah. That's Pro actually base, the new Triforce yeah. right there. Yeah, 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 yeah. That is the trifecta. I mean, he's just absolutely hit a nail on the head. I love myself and I love all you guys. Oh, and I do love my Panther. So. Oh, <laughs> so much love. So we come together. If anyone needs his number, he tells us all the time. He tells so us all know. the time. He's getting an A-Ram game with him, apparently. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Another from the fans. Uh, number one, at the end, return to the LCO. Number two, Kevy back for my Chiefs. Number three, look, I'm going to butcher some of these names. Uh, so yep, but he said cutie. Somewhere near the bottom of the list is Rusty and Skimmy. It's happy to be here. It's happy to be here. I'm happy you're here. What matters is we're on the list. You know what That's we what need matters. What? Those tiny little plastic trophies. Like, we're here, guys. We're <laughs> participation <laughs> award. We, we. Thank you for participating in the LCU we broadcast. <laughs> we do our job. You guys do a fantastic yeah. job of it as well. Something that you haven't really done fantastic in the past. I'll say it. I'll call you out. <gasps> is your predictions? They've been a bit hit or miss of the times. Twitch chat hacks. I don't know what you want from Okay, us. so. They outnumber you. Yeah. Production. Twitch chat won last split, but who was second? Who was the first this, loser? Yeah. Doesn't matter. Yeah. I want to know. You. Oh, here you go. Here's that tiny trophy again. You're the first loser. Oh, oh friend. Here's your big oh, old fat L. Little trophy friends. Oh, friends. Oh, you got two trophies by each other. Great. That's good for you. Uh, apparently, production's trying to figure They're out. They're going to find you, it out. Yeah, they are. They are. Oh, if it's not any of us. That was a curveball out of nowhere. If yeah, production, production now, like in the back end, they got like their six computers lined up yeah. trying to do the maths of adding together how the space far. Space control room. Which one Down in the lattice. Skimmy was, oh, apparently it was actually Skimmy that came second. It's just too easy. It's just too easy. <laughs> Another day at the office. Do you no. think you're going to be able to run it back to back then? No. As uh, first loser. No. no faith. No faith as no. being first loser. <laughs> we can have a look at our power rankings for this split because we've seen four teams already, but the next four that we haven't seen just yet are Pennet, Mammoth, Ground, Zero, and Kangaroo. Seeing where we all put them, it's a bit of a mix up. You got to mash of where we all see them coming this split. Mm. A lot of people do have Mammoth around the fifth place, except for the, you know, the person who came second to Twitch chat and predictions uh, for that first split. Skimmy's got a lot more faith in Mammoth than the rest of us. Just a believer, just a wild card, really. I mean, um, I remember when me and Telly were talking about it, he was saying, like, I'm really interested to see where you put your predictions. And then when I told him, he's like, hang on a minute, you're basically the same as me. So I'm actually... <laughs> Intrigued by the fact that we are so similar in that regard. And I just, yeah, just had a funny feeling that, you know, Mammoth have heavily invested into their roster. Make some magic. Something something spectacular could happen as a result of that one. So, big fan. I, it's really hard to, like, predict the bottom four just because there's so much, like, uh, so many new people coming in and so much, like, unproven stuff, like, happening down there. So, I think that's why it's so, it looks so jumbled. But I think that like, having Mammoth, like, 
as a playoff contender is like pretty obvious for a lot of people. What I will say, Skimmy, is looking at, at your list having Diables fifth and, and hearing what Chaz said yesterday in his interview that they've got a jungler and coach potentially coming in. Oh, it's all, that might it's be the ruined. biggest clown nose I've ever seen it's of a ruined. prediction. <laughs> if those players are who but I think the they rough are. Thing. <laughs> this is the rough thing with predictions, right? Is you make them well in advance, then changes happen. You're like, okay. The this is week one. On. We yeah. didn't matter. <laughs> it's week layer one. one. <laughs> layer two. Layer three. We should do that. We at the end of the split, we should see how far off everyone is, and for how far off you are, you should just like add another layer of more clan face makeup. paint. Yeah, and so more face, and the then the wig, costume. and then the cost, the nose. So if all eight is wrong, you are a clown. You that are is you are a whole clown. We need eight clown. steps of being transformed into a clown and see who ends up the most clown. I know our social team would love that. Casting finals for me in a full clown. Someone, someone clip it and ship it, so then we remember when we do end up at the end of. Split two. This this is going to be one of those content ideas that just goes out into the wind and we never see it back. It's wouldn't be mad if it peters off. No, <laughs> I, I, I would be. I, I want to see Rusty in the full clown suit. Do you remember 100%. when we dressed up? When uh, what was it? 2021? And oh, you did yeah. your Mumu cosplay, oh, yeah. and I, I dressed up as <laughs> Doctor Mundo. Oh, we did. Like, what, we run what, it back. What, what was the theme of it? It was like budget nice, cosplay. Yeah, budget cosplay. We did budget cosplay. Do you remember? Oh. That? Yeah, no, I think I have seen a purple skin and somewhere. And Jude came as Shaco, and he had the face paint. He literally came as a. And Mac was V Timo. I remember. <laughs> yes. Oh yes. yeah, that was good. We should bring that one back one time. We should. Let's bring back the toilet paper free yeah. budget cosplay <laughs> again. <laughs> I, I, Condition, you can't do the same champion. The toilet paper's the coming off me, guys. What do I do? <laughs> you have no idea. I don't even want to get into the roughy. back. Yeah, I don't want to get into the back ends of what <laughs> ha happened off uh, off screen, off broadcast uh, with that toilet paper when I was doing the interviews back then. But let's keep on moving forward for today. Let's keep on having a look at what is up next because we've got our rosters showing for Pentanet. And who's on that team over there, Tally? We have the standard lineup from Split 1 of <laughs> Chippy, Shern, Dongy, Violet, and Appy. I think it's really cool the fact that they haven't made any roster moves. I think that it's cool to run it back with your same five players. Even though they didn't really hit the performance that they wanted, it's it's cool that they trust each other and mm -hmm. they can work forward towards you know a better goal. 100%. I am excited to see this Pentanet grow and develop as a team, right? They are the, the original roster that made that decision to, to live in Perth, to, to scrim against Southeast Asian teams, and they, they set themselves in how they wanted to play. For Pentanet, however, they did end up losing, ultimately, I believe, the fourth place position through yeah. playoffs. And so I think a lot of reflection needed to happen for this team between the splits on, you know, what did we do that was good? What do we keep? And what should we change to find those improvements? Because I think they can they can improve the most from their final position, I think, of all teams in split one. Do you guys know if they are all still in Perth? Is that a decision that they decided they'll I believe they're all still in Perth. Okay. I, I don't know how they're practicing. Yeah. That okay. is the, that's Definitely my a prime question. interview question. Yeah. Yeah, Tally's already got that one written down. Yeah, beautiful. It. Yeah. Gave him <laughs> the, the S tier question. Anyway, uh, their <laughs> opponents are going to be Mammoth Esports, of course, and they've had a massive roster change, Tally. Yeah, so it's real. Once again, this is like really cool to see Mammoth finally like step into the league and bring like such veteran faces in Dian and Dejong, and new even returning players in Sully, and like such well known players in Cheon. And we have Tang C. Changing name to Hayden. Oh, from Hayden to Tengsi to Hexsplash yeah, now. Yes. Thank you. So, I mean, it's just cool to see, like, a new competitor in the league. So I'm excited to watch them. Yep, we're going to have a look at what the old Mammoth roster was yeah. and the new one so you guys can really see just how much has changed. And it's literally every role except <laughs> for that mid down there, Skimmy. It is, and I mean, I've been a massive fan of Daljong ever since he, um, you know, he made his introduction when he played for Gravitas. I saw some promise. He's been a big, um, big fan of the, you know, the, the pocket pick Zoe, which has always been denied away from him. And I think this is a massive opportunity for him now to prove that he deserves to play with this, you know, caliber of, of, of a team, really, because um, his win rates aren't going to look the hottest based on the roster he's, he's been with, right? But you're now surrounded by um, the likes of, as you can see there, you know, Tien, Suli, Cheon, and Hexflash, all these members that have been in prime positions before. They've either been top solo queue, they've been in top teams, they've been in championship winning positions. So, you know, you have that sort of environment, you become a product of that environment, and I hope that, you know, Dajang as a result can level up. Yeah, we might be seeing um, just a whole new mammoth. Like, for me, I think that was actually the toughest team to put in my power rankings just from when I first was on LCO back in 2021, trying to stay up to date with it in 2022. Mammoth definitely felt like they fell a little bit to the wayside of mm -hmm. still there, still participating, still adding value to Oast in the LCO, but never really standing out. There isn't this memorable moment for me where I'm just like, damn, yeah, let's go Mammoth, let's go. 
Yeah, not since I think it was 2019. Yep. Uh, maybe 2020, but 2019 when they were the split winning team. You know, the superstars who we, we've sent so many <laughs> of them. Remember. We've sent all of them over to North America, <laughs> yeah. basically, from that point onwards, right? There was, it was a star started roster fudge in that list as well. That was his first ever mm -hmm. split of competitive league. Wow. And I'm sure that's a name that everyone does know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, we haven't seen a mammoth to, to be like, you didn't look at the roster and think that could win. Uh, for, for a little while. And this is one of those rosters that I think you can be much more excited about uh, if you are an old school league fan or a current Mammoth fan. Mm -hmm. How long do you think it would take synergy-wise, Tally, for a new roster like this? Like, let's say you were put into a new team or if you were to create a team sort of around you in the mid lane, how long do you think you would want to give before you're like, okay, we're not hitting expectations anymore? Generally, it's like a pretty quick thing. Like, you're all playing the same game and like, Competitive is not that different from just solo queue. Mm -hmm. Like in scrimming, it's you, you all you all know like how to win. It's just about like how you how well you like work together as people. I think that like getting along is really important to having like a productive team environment. And I think that like majority of these players are like good people. Like I had Sully was my sub back in was it 2019. Like I like I've been familiar with him for ages, so it's exciting to see him come back. I think he was a really talented player back then. And it's, yeah, it's just cool to see him play now. Alrighty. I do know, though, that we're going to be having a chat to Penta now. We've got Violet on the line. We get to ask him some questions. Violet, hello. How are you today? Hello. I'm doing well. Thank you. Yeah, I wanted to ask, uh, is everyone on the side of Pentanet still in Perth? Are you guys still living together? Or, like, what's the situation on the goal for Pentanet? Yeah, we're all back in Perth. Some of us went, uh, went back home for, like, a short break, but... We're all back at the house now in Perth, just scrimming, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a bit of a short break. How long have you guys been scrimming? Was it past week, past two weeks? Um, what was the, the LCO prep for you? Uh, we've been scrimming for like the past two weeks, I think. We haven't been scrimming too much, honestly, because it's been a struggle to find scrims. And a lot of times, like scrims have been canceled, whether it's on our side or the opponents. So we haven't been scrimming too much, but yeah. It okay. should still be good for today's game. Yeah, of course. And uh, speaking on scrims, so I know like last week you guys were like scrimming a lot more of, of the PCS teams. Are you guys looking to scrim a lot more like in like your local area? Uh, yeah, the split we're mixing it up. We're gonna be scrimming everything, I think, like Vietnam, PCS, and OS as well. So we're scrimming all three now. Where last split it was just Vietnam and PCS. Okay, and. Since, well, I assume you guys would have been very disappointed with your results and you didn't really hit the expectations. And now that you're running it back with the same five players, like, what is different about Pensnet this split compared to last split? Mm, I'd honestly say we're just trying to keep things just more simple and straightforward. I think last split we were, like, trying to, trying to do too much at once. And I think this split we're just going to focus on, like, I guess the fundamental core of gameplay. So that we can actually just play the game properly instead of like trying to do too much like copying like the, the better regions and stuff just gonna do our own thing first and those how are you managing that with such a big patch at the moment and obviously not that many competitive games especially in the os region being played on it yet is this something that your coach is helping you a lot with or as a five you're kind of being like okay that idea is a little bit too far like let's reel it back let's try to keep it a little bit more simple I think, I mean, in the current patch right now, I think a lot of us are just playing solo queue, you know, and just testing it, testing out, like, what's good, what's strong. Where the coach usually gives us, like, a lot of uh, input, he listens to our input, so yeah, I'd say a lot of it is, like, 50-50, like, we do our own testing in solo queue and stuff, or, like, we watch the other regions, and then we try to apply it to our solo queue games. If we think it's good, we let them know, and yeah, we just test stuff out on scrims. Oh, awesome. I'm excited to see how it works for you guys today. Thank you so much for joining us, Violet. Thank you. So, yeah. There you go. You just watch. You try repeat. If it doesn't work, you put it in the bin and you go back to Old Faithful. That works, right? <laughs> yeah, but I'm curious because, you know, really their, their, their play style last split was all about very aggressive four-man dives into the bot lane, looked mm -hmm. to try and snowball their bot lane as quickly as they could. You'd see mm -hmm. that in the stats for Violent, particularly his laning stats were something absurd in terms of like CS advantage, XP advantage and all the rest. I think you looked at Shernfire, it was like literally the only person playing Lee Sin. I True. think the caveat to that was though, that when they would lose to teams like Bliss, Chiefs or Direwolves, it's because they weren't able to snowball in the early game. That almost looked a little bit solved. Like if the dive happened, it was weathered and then sort of repelled, um, they would look a little bit lost. So I think for them, it's a case of, yeah, maybe keeping it a little bit more simple. To that one end, I would say that it feels like the meta is in a good position for them. I feel like Dongy had a great first split, um, switching into the mid position. 
think the champion pool he has is great for this new facilitator role that it has to be. And if it is all about an AD carry meta, we know that Ultraviolet can certainly fit the bill. Do you feel like this patch is one that's going to suit them? Do you very much subscribe to what Sk Skimmy's saying about the play style? And maybe they actually don't need to change that much from split one. And that could be another advantage of having the same roster. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with Skimmy. I think this is like a very dongy meta. And I think that like PGG, they do want to be playing like those hyper carry metas with, you know, the Superstar Violet. So I think that since he's able to play a lot more of those like utility mids and like Asante and all, they're carries, but they do everything. Yeah. A lot of these like these CC, like I can help the team kind of champions, I mm -hmm. think this will fit re PGG really well. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll also have to talk about Mammoth a little bit more and we can get some more information about them because we do have Sully joining us here. Sully, hello, how are you today? Yeah, what's going on? I'm good. That's how good. That's good. I'm liking the energy already. I, I want to ask, you know, I was doing some research, just trying to look into you a little bit as a player, and you've taken a year off. I want to know, and I want you to tell everyone at home that might not be familiar, what have you been doing in that meantime? How have you been keeping up with Pro League, and what are you excited to bring to the Split 2? Yeah, um, after I quit from Iron Wolves at the end of Split 1 last year, I did nothing. I played poker, like, 24-7, just playing poker. Um, then, after, like, five that is unfortunate. After, after what? After, That's it. Well, no, no, no. We will I'm never know. We will literally what? never what's know. Next? We will what's never... next? No one throwing... knew. No one will ever know. That's the wrong game, mate. Cut him off. <laughs> oh, he told me that was late. You got to League of Legends <laughs> in a minute. Get out of here. Get him out of here. Scum. Terry, his house looked baller, didn't it? It did. That was a nice backdrop. Yeah, maybe he's done well in the past year. We should also it. probably clarify there's not another Wolf team in our league. <laughs> uh, Iron Wolves was not from <laughs> Oast. <laughs> <laughs> he, was, he was competing in a European league, so he left Oast in like 2020 uh, and went over to the yes. ERL leagues for, yes. for that two-year period. So when he says Iron Wolves, he doesn't mean another Die Wolves competitor <laughs> uh, <laughs> or a Vertex. Vertex competitor. It's a bit of a weird homecoming in a way because, yeah, he was actually a founding member of Pensnet back in 2020. So, like, yeah. he's come back and his first game is up against his old organization. So. I just saw my brain was just like, what if he didn't realize he cut off and he kept talking for the last <laughs> few minutes? We've all been there. How many <laughs> times have you muted your mic and you've talked? And, I said, I'm just like, this is so Why nice. is no one responding to me, <laughs> like guys? 30 minutes straight. Have I just been talking to board. myself? Am I crazy? Like, we bring him back. Back in a minute, we're like, yeah, can no, you we, say it again? He's like, I don't care anymore. Yeah, we do have him back <laughs> on the line, so we'll bring him back in. <laughs> so we'll leave. It happens. It happens. Uh, please continue, though, letting us know. We heard we heard up to when you left Iron Wolves, and that was about it. Yeah, so, yeah, I left Iron Wolves. Um, and then I just started playing poker. Like, I wasn't really playing League. I didn't plan to play more League. Mm -hmm. And then after a bit, you know, you get that, like, itch to play again. I got, like, rank one in solo queue. Quit again. And then I was just been doing nothing playing poker really and then Mammoth hit me up with a really talented roster and I was like I'll give it a shot yeah, <laughs> I swear so yeah. you're like there's absolutely no way that I can skip up on this opportunity what do you think is probably one of your biggest strengths or something that you're hoping to prove in the LCO um my biggest strength I think is my ability to carry as a jungler um compared to the rest of the junglers as well I think that's my standout skill um and I'm just looking to like honestly I just want to compete have fun and look our roster is really good, so there's a chance we can win it all. So I just want to give it my all, and if not, no worries. That sounds good. I love the mindset. <laughs> uh, what do you think about the meta currently? Because I know you're a really carry-centric player, and like the meta is a lot more focused around like like the team fighters and like the gankers, and not so much like pulling out your hecarims and, hecarims and stuff. So like, are you going to conform to like what is being played right now, or are you going to stick to your like tried and true hecarims? Um, yeah. Look, I'm just going to stick to what works for me, and um. These carry junglers, like, I can excel really well in team fights, particularly if I'm got enough resource. So I really back myself in to be a good carry player. Like, if I'm playing some type of AP carry in a team fight, I, I can 1v9 for sure. So I don't need to 1v9. I've got a really good team, anyways. But, like, yeah, I'm going to stick to my guns. I'm not going to be pulling out much uh, Sejuani or <laughs> Zach or, I don't know, Jarvan. Not my style. Um Coming back, this is your first game in LCO. You're coming up against your uh, old OS org, Pentanet. Do you think there's a little bit extra on top to prove to be like, hey, I'm returning, even though they're different players, that's my old org, and, and I kind of just want to show up and be like, hey, I am better. Yeah, I mean, one thing that helped me back when I was on Pentanet was exactly what Tali was just talking about. Like, I was forced to play champs that I wasn't comfortable on and that didn't suit my style. And so I'm just excited to like prove that like, maybe if they gave me a better chance, I carried champs when I was on that team that it would have worked out better and that I'm going to prove that I am the better character player. So, yeah. 
Awesome. We look forward to it. Silly, thank you so much for joining us and good luck today. Thanks, guys. See ya. Best See ya. Work. Nice little insight. I didn't know that, but he's a bit of a off matter jungler these days. He hit the two big points for me because if you actually look at the time he spent on Pentanet, it was spamming like Lee Sid and Gragas. But yeah. then if you look at the sort of champions he's really akin to, it Carthus. is the Hecarims, it's the Carthus, <laughs> it's the Dianas, you know, it's the Leas, for instance, right? It's all about I'm going to carry. We're yeah. an absolute team fight menace. 1v9. Little, a little story, actually. Ooh. Back in uh, 2019 when I was our sub, Spawn every single day would try to get him to play Lee Sin because it was the most broken juggler and he was just locking in Karthus every <laughs> single game. I believe He's he played on stage <laughs> once and played Karthus, didn't he? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he just he loved Karthus. If you're going to show up, you may as well play something you want to play Rats game. Absolutely. I mean, you, you can be told one thing from your coach, but sometimes a little bit of player power comes into control. Look, I, I did want to ask, and, you know, maybe as the split progresses and we see what he's pulling out a little bit more, I want to know how much he's putting his foot down. He's like, this. Nope, this. I want to know, like, just how strong that voice is inside him or if something's going to change over the course of this split. So something to maybe keep in mind of um, to, yeah, just keep in the back of our heads there. But we got our side select for this matchup. Now, we're showing you game one mm. and game two sides like because if you didn't know, if you're just tuning in, they're all best of twos uh, this split. That is the format we're adapting. And so the side select is picked before they even come into this matchup. So for game one, Pentanet picked themselves red side and game two, Mammoth also picking red side. What's up with that, Tally? The uh, blue side was the Yeah, you, you came in <laughs> yesterday so sure. You're like, it's going to be blue side, blue side, blue side, more blue side. We're going to get sick of seeing the word blue. Well, okay, to be fair, like, there are, like, metas that are developed in your own regions. And, like, we could be seeing something where, like, there is different... Like, we haven't seen any Yumi Friday in Oast, whereas in the rest of the world, sure. it's one of the best picks. So, like, Oast could be seeing completely different champions as a priority. And, like, yep. because of that, we're seeing way more red priority. I do want to say, I think... Last split also, Pentanet had a big emphasis on red side as well. We saw Chippies would be saved that picks. At times you play like Darius, for example, when you play like Ignite Darius top lane and try and get a cheese kill and it worked more times than not. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's just a clear conscious decision that, hey, we're going to counter pick you. Um, and especially into like, say, TN, if that is to be the matchup, to carry style top laners, um, you want to make sure you get the better better half the deal. Also, it's the double tank flex, right? Because they're both top laners. You know, Dongy's just transitioned to, to mid, back to mid, I should say. But yep. like, while he can play the Ari, he could also just pick Kasante first and yeah. they'll never know which True. lane it is. So True. There's mm -hmm. a lot of flexibility there. We've got the uh, the checklist going down of everything we need to do before our game's going to start. Def and vote. Do you guys want to help me point to it? I was thinking this this time we could we could do it this way, though. I could start with this arm oh. and then and then this way. And then, Skims, you got to like add your arm on top of tallies. So it looks like one continuous line oh, all the way to where they can do the fan vote. You ready? you got to no, you got to line up you your elbow with his hand. Arm. All right, like this way, and then put your other arm. Like a laptop on. Yep. <laughs> and then Skimmy, you have to, and then just keep pointing. I'm a Keep pointing, and then ah, Rusty's got it for us all the way out there. If you guys want to do a death. I was vote. trying so hard. I to know you were. And I was like, and Tally's, Tally's like putting in no effort. He's actually like leaning further away. He's like, <laughs> Skimmy could have done it. He's tall. You can make it. Uh, you can make it. You can make it. Tally. You're done. Thanks. Yeah, you guys can put in your vote there. Uh, you can do. <laughs> <laughs> You take that back. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, sorry. <laughs> I wanted to see you stand up. I wanted to see you put a little bit more emotion to that one, Tally. Take up one back. You put your dev and votes there. And we can see where all of us talent have put our votes, where we think this one's going to be. Oh, right now, myself, Max, Gimme. I think it's going to be a draw in this best of two. Did we all? Okay, yeah. We, we all. actually Ooh. all Wait, went we were for all a the draw. same yesterday, and we're all the same you right now. You guys copying me? I don't oh, know, yeah, you know, I actually. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I walked in into the production room and I was like, whatever tally puts, put me down. <laughs> and then game two is whatever I had, I believe is what you said today. No, I actually did Ooh. pick myself for Ooh. game two. I think I went the complete opposite of everyone. Uh, you Ooh. know what? We'll talk about when we get That's there. Three choices. What's the opposite? Did we all do the same thing <laughs> I again? Think you oh, did. No. Oh, I don't know. Crazy. Like I said, we can talk about it when, when we get there. But right now, we think it's even split. Is it because, you know, Pendant did fall a little bit short last split, Skimmy, and we don't know the hmm. full power of this new roster in Mammoth. I think it is a little bit of both. I think it's, you sort of, there's a known quantity just to how good Pentanet can be, but at the same time, you're unsure just how good Mammoth are coming in together, how much acquired synergy there is from the very get-go. Mm -hmm. Well, you can keep on talking, Skimmy, okay. because I know Champ Select is ready. Beautiful. <laughs> Let's do it. Let's jump into the first game of the night as Mammoth start on the left-hand side here. And they're going to open up their accounts with a few different bands. We were talking about some of the bands that were must ban last night, and those were the likes of, you know, your Milios, your Zeris, as well as your Maokais. Mm -hmm. A few differences here today. Yeah, we're still going to see the Milio, uh, but so far we haven't seen a Zeri, and we have not seen a Maokai. So a lot of choices here. However, you heard it in the interview with Suli. 
probably not going to be the Sejuani Maokai player. Probably is going to be the carry player. Yeah. And that does affect draft and, and ban phase in particular a whole lot. Uh, makes things a lot easier for Pencent in regards to their bans if they don't have to get rid of three must-ban champions. Uh, Zeri, of course, is going to go. Milio is going to go. Maokai is that last remaining 100% ban rate champion from yesterday. Uh, and I don't think this should be a surprise to anyone no. because it is an AP champion that can go in the jungle. And while it is flexible, it is an AP champion that can go in the jungle, Skimmy. So Suli is going to be happy. Yeah, I'm sure they'll be having uh, big discussions between himself and Dajong as to who gets to uh, part of that one going into this game here. If the affiliates gets locked in, that continues the 100% pick rate on the champion. It's a little bit too strong. And uh, Valet's going to guarantee that, uh, much like Praetor yesterday, if you give them the champion, he can do wonderful things with it. Perhaps partner with uh, okay. Lulu nice and early, and you've guaranteed that this is your bot lane, and this is the way you want to play. <laughs> Straight into the Kha'Zix. So something that we did talk about yesterday uh, was banned away from forever uh, in his debut game from Vertex is actually going to be available to be picked by Suli. Yep. Go straight towards the Assassin. So keep in mind here, Kha'Zix has a lot of kill threat, a lot of carry potential in the game for sure, and can just you know pull apart a carry and remove them from the game. Could pull out an Enchanter, right, and one hit this Lulu. But at the same time, Lulu's a shield champion that can actually stay quite healthy and stay alive. And now they've picked the Graves, can couple quite nicely with the Graves pick uh, as they move around as a 2v2. So it will be interesting to watch how this Kha'Zix plays out. I'm very excited to see it work and to see Suli Cook as he moves around on the rim. And to the point about the Kha'Zix, I'd love to see a Serpent's Fang, especially if you are going to be going into uh, a lot of shields. Um, certainly a champion that can find a little bit more value compared to, say, a, uh, a ranged character instead. Uh, I believe still they're going to be running first strike from the Kha'Zix, just get a lot of gold, a, a stronger burst profile in that sort of 1v1. So. Wouldn't be too surprised to see that get locked in as a result. But as we narrow down the champion pool, especially in the bot lane, that is now what? One, two, three, four, 80 carries taken away to try and make Mammoth's life a little bit harder. I think the only person I know in this league that will do a lot of different tech with Kha'Zix would be why not, right? Like you, you can think of other keystones that could be valuable, but yeah, the first strike gonna be the most common one. Uh, and we'll, we'll see exactly how he chooses to play it. But most importantly here, Mammoth's draft, three picks in, is just strong, right? The, the Nico strength, Cassante strength in the meta right now is very profound. You've got on the same side, however, an Aphelios Lulu that scales really nicely and a Graves that scales really nicely, but their composition isn't complete yet. It is just a bunch of carries and a bunch of damage. So Pensanet's still looking for a solidified 4-5, where Mammoth with their first three are just already strong. But they certainly are. And can I say also at the same time, this is quite exciting from a bot lane perspective because it is old teammates and Cheon and Violet going up against each other, right? They yeah, shared true. the spotlight together on peace. Um, they had many variations as to what that bot lane would look like. And now Chen's going to get a chance to showcase, okay, actually who was better and who really deserves that starting spot. But the champion ball has been limited. I guess the Zaya is being slightly deterred with the Rakan being removed away. Do know that Chern is a very good virus if that were to uh, be needed. It certainly is. Lucian gone, Ezreal gone, Jinx still upright, so it should come as a surprise to no one that this is a possibility. Uh, and a champion that I guess we should just continue to mention, even though no one knows Shania has picked it, is that Yumi still going to be up and available at any point. Yeah. Uh, and enchanters are still logical choices in most comps, but we mentioned this yesterday, Skimmy, and just to quickly reiterate, Jinx can work in most compositions by just getting excited by hitting zaps and ults and start getting those auto attacks off with Rocket and just pot shot, right? Get excited. You don't necessarily need the support of your team or an Enchanter if the composition allows you to still get damage off in fights. Bliss did that very successfully, and I feel like Mammoth are taking a page from their book with this comp. And I agree, and I think Pentina have a, a few good tools to try and deny that first reset for the Jinx, especially with the Wild Growth, as well as the Frozen Tomb of the Lissandra, right? So, you know, deny... Um, the possibility of Jinx getting excited could certainly be a way for Pentanet to, you know, win a potential front to back. I'm curious to see how they round out this composition as to why don't mind Red that. Side was that much of a priority. Of course he does, of course he does. It's a chippy special, isn't it? It's a chippy special in Tan. You can see the smile on his face once that got <laughs> locked in. He knows what he's against. When you verse chippies, Olaf is always an option. He is one of the only Olaf players that we have in our league. Tron. Uh, is the second and only name that comes to mind for Olaf players, particularly in top lane. Yeah. Uh, so it is all chippies all the time right now. That Malphite pick could have worked, though. You know, I saw that Malphite pick and I was like, I don't mind that. Lissandra is kind of the centerpiece of their composition for me now. If you think about Pentanet's overall 5v5, how is this going to operate? 
Olaf can flank. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, Olaf kind of has to flank if he wants to team fight as a, as a top lane Olaf and get onto the carries, right? Nico can't ult him, Nautilus can't stop him. And they are a bunch of CC oriented tanks in top lane and support, right? So he has got some tools that some of the chippies have spoken about. He's a big fan of versing uh, with this Olaf pick. But they don't have crowd control that isn't a purple weapon or a Lissandra, right? So they're really reliant on being able to attack the right people to get this done, right? Purple Gravitum ultimates from the Aphelios or just a huge Lissandra engage yep. are going to be, I think, the, the key tenets of a successful fight by the side of Pensanet in this game. I think to your point then, target priority is going to be of the utmost importance, right? Vision denial with, you know, um, smoke screens and all the rest to try and find what you're after, get the angle and get the position to, you know, battle between who can get that reset first, between, you know, the uh, frozen reincarnations of your opposition or, you know, Jinx is running around saying, you can't catch me. So here are your two compositions. Here are the new looks for both of these teams coming into this one are completely rejuvenated. Mammoth side, you'd have to say, as Pensanet have stuck to their guns, stuck Straight to the five-man squads. And have loaded themselves into the rift to kickstart a brand new campaign here. Best of two, a fair a chance for us to jump back into the Oceanic Pools League. That's right. We may have changed the acronym of our <laughs> league. <laughs> but the culture stays. The culture remains the same. Of course, we will get through this pause as quickly as we possibly can. Not the way we want to start our day either. At what point... Does tradition get marred with superstition in that you need these pauses? Otherwise, it just wouldn't feel like a split. You get dependent on them. Yeah. Like a, a weird pause-based like, like Stockholm mm, syndrome. Like, why have there not been any pauses? What's going on here in Australia today? I can't play my best unless I've disconnected at least once. Yeah, that's true. I don't think that should ever happen. If that does happen, we've got big issues. We've definitely been Stockholm <laughs> syndrome. <yeah. laughs> we've, got, we've got big problems to address. More than more than the internet. And that's a problem enough for a lot of people. Let's um, return to your point from beforehand. So you mentioned uh, from the side of Pentanet that there is a big absence of hard control or hard CC mm -hmm. um, to try and find those picks. Um, uh, you know, generally speaking, which composition? I, I always like to use the term ease of execution. Would you say that favors one team more than the other? Uh, so ease of execution is an interesting one in this game because you have to remember that the, the comp that Mammoth have is a Nico composition, which has to usually be quite creative to be successful. Mm -hmm. Kha'Zix as well. Uh, while there's a lot of, you know, W Evolve Kha'Zix out there that I think is quite simple, I I don't know if that's the preferred Evolve pathway anymore with a lot of the, the nerfs that have kind of come across to that. I still think it's an option. I still think it's perfectly fine in certain situations. Uh, and then the goal is going to be to to basically kill someone so that Jinx can carry the team fights and get excited, right? So as we get into this game, you're expecting a lot of creativity from the whole top side. I didn't include Cassante. Yeah. While it's simple in, in ID, you still want to get good ults off. You still want to isolate carries. If they get those flanks, they get those picks, we get the Jinx excited, then it's really easy to play for Mammoth, but the creativity will still have to be there. The setup will still have to be there prior to the execution from them. Uh, so it's this weird, like, I don't know which composition is truly easier to execute, when a Lissandra and a Nautilus kind of fill the same role for each respective team, right? Yeah. There is still an engage tool that will exist. Mm -hmm. I think I'd rather be Mammoth's comp, though. Well, that's why I ask, because I, I feel like Mammoth have so many flanking tools that maybe you get a little bit too lost in the source, but there's nobody actually with Chain anymore. Everybody's coming from different positions on the map to say, hey, we've got the jump, we've got that, you know, Ooh, that one-shot potential. Me, we might have to hold this conversation depending on what happens here. Dajong is in mid lane. Well, there's only three members of Mammoth here. Pensanet with a late invade, we'll see them. It is a very late invade, and Schoenfeier's the first one to jump on in and get things started. Next flash is able just to use a hook against the wall to jump out to safety, but Schoenfeier is going to keep that red buff entertained despite its best attempts to try and reset back to its position. They're going to leave back to lane, so Sully actually finds himself in a 1v1 here. Junglers will see each other, and look at the chaos from Hex Flash not wanting to go to his lane. He flashes the wall. Yeah, he won't use a Hex Flash. He'll use the real one, that's for sure, as uh, Schoenfire is in trouble. Falls to burn a flash of his own, but leaps across the wall as fully commits the flash of his own. And it's a welcome reintroduction back home for First Blood. And Pensanet.gg commit to the late invade, but they don't commit to the play. They leave Schoenfire to the wolves, and they go back to their respective lanes. And Mammoth, they're closer to the action. They're closer to the play. That's all it takes. Schoenfire gets punished massively 
from a team-wide decision on a late invade that was executed incorrect. Yeah, certainly was. Where's their crowd control? And no hesitation is once again the big thing for me from Mammoth. You know, you saw that uh, the Nautilus was like, I'm going for this, we're making it happen. Same could be said then of the Karzik, instantly jumping across into the Dragon Pit. We will get this kill, I will become fed. And it is that concern for PGG, the one I'm hoping to see evolve throughout Split 2. What happens if they don't snowball the early game? I mean, it's something that's going to have to be looked at in this game, to be certain. Uh, with a, a lot more difficult of a clear for Shonefire, but mainly the reason for that is just more money into the hands of Suli. Gets to start his clear, do three camps if he would like, and have bonus 400 odd gold there, as well as having won that smite fight. He's in a very comfortable position for himself. Also, I believe, dodged the ward that was placed at level one on his Raptor camp, has gone from his red side straight to the blue, and might just find himself thongy on the reset to stop him from getting that base off as well. Getting very active on the map right now. If this is a 1v9 jungler who said as much in his interview that that's what he wants to do, you have to always watch Sully right now. Absolutely. It's always exciting to see, you know, those carries come from different positions, especially when a meta can be so defined as that this is the way the game must be played. But teams decide this is how we want to uh, deploy ourselves and find that success. Still continued aggression in the bot lane, as is to be expected when an enchanter goes into a hook lane. Happy copping a bit of a beating here. Certainly true. Does still have the potions, however. He still has one in the bank, so we'll be able to stack that up. Hex Flash used by Hex Flash. I think he's intentionally trying to make us annoyed having to say that all the time. 100%. Uh, given that it is a feature in League of Legends. Uh, either way, he'll use his namesake. And it's constant pressure onto the Lulu. One of the best ways you play this lane out is the Nautilus. Just try and stop the Lulu from having a free lane. You get just, just enough health away from that Lulu that she doesn't want to step up and make these constant trades, then the hook champion can kind of go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the ranged, annoying enchanter. Uh, if not, then they just keep priority, they keep pushing, they whittle your health bar down slowly but surely, and you start to get pushed out of the lane. So you can see constantly being proactive, you know, using the hex flash now that it's on cooldown or available. See if they make a mistake. What I'd say, it's just the pressure. It could happen at any given moment, and that pressure is going to be felt elsewhere, especially on the top lane here as Tien cops a bit of a beating. Uh, a bit of a helping hand from Pentanet's own jungler. Shown fire now with double buffs of his own, able to pop his head there and see what's up. See from the dare fan vote. Once again, an overwhelming majority of you believing that Pentanet are the clear favorites. Still 30% more than we saw with the favorite versus the underdog yesterday. That's true. Which were nearing the 100% mark, which was insane. 30% still pretty strong mammoth base of voters. Sully so far ahead in tempo, by the way, just through his jungle clearing. You can see Shonefire's top gank is Sully's able to clear and move his way in. Didn't quite get vision down and of course will be spotted here, but his sights are set on enemy Gromp or Drake and is bringing his support up for that play. Into the mid lane we go then. Make sure that this wave will crash. And then have the freedom to rotate, roam, and do as they please. Level 6 is there now, coming across the board for a majority of members. That does mean that Mammoth with priority can go for this very first dragon. Not a whole lot that Pentanet can do to respond. Shoved and bot, as well as mid. First dragon will go the way of Mammoth. And you know, one thing we should really look at uh, as a whole when we form check this, this new reinvigorated roster of Mammoth is... I'll hold the thought. Oh, the fault indeed. All that mode happens as Tien looks to try and be a bit of a gamer. He's going to get flashed away from by Chippies there, knowing that he could have been dragged right back. Yeah, well done from Tien though, of course, forcing both summoner spells out. Chippies not running the teleport in this game, it should be noted, which is why he's able to flash away. You see an Olaf flash and you kind of do a double take for a second. You're like, why does he have that? That's weird. They usually run Ghost. But he does, he has both. Uh, the thing that I wanted to just reiterate quickly, Skimmy, is Dajon. The only remaining member of Mammoth from Split 1. Yep. Uh, a player who we've always kind of looked at in the Mammoth roster, in the Gravitas roster prior, and thought, like, has got potential, right? Has got his signature picks, has had some big carry moments, but has never really had a winning squad. Uh, this is the first time you would say in Dajung's entire career as a, as a pro player where he has a squad where he is... The word isn't the weakest link, mm -hmm. but doesn't have to be the star of the show. Correct. Right? Can just be a facilitator for his team. And his role in, in the meta right now for mid is very much centered around that. So 
I'm very curious to see how he goes as a hook connects. So he does connect, and Violet's in a lot of trouble. He's going to go for that preemptive cleanse. Chompers were down, and a lot of damage has been laid down as a result of that one. It is going to be Mammoth Spotlane that comes out ahead by a massive margin. Look at the health ball trading. Now Schoenfire is forced to rotate bot lane, knowing that tool. Predicting, you'd imagine, that Sully shouldn't be too far behind. Yeah, so far, so good as the lane is concerned for Mammoth in this 2v2. Happy and Violet, they've had some push, they're being pressured. They're up in farm, but you've seen a lot more active movement from Hex Flash around the map, uh, which may be a part of why it is about a one wave difference in CS overall. The Dongy hard pressured in mid lane. Once again, we've been seeing these Nikos just relentlessly push. It's one of the biggest strengths, of course, of the champion is the, the Q just annihilates waves. You press E through it, and then suddenly it pops multiple times. That pop blossom just one hits creeps. Suddenly you just you have to deal with it. You have to spend mana just holding on. And then you're getting harassed at the same time. Lissandra wants to stand in the wave to throw her Q through it. Gets hit by Nico's out of lane. Yeah, it's frustrating, right? Because there's a massive uh, range discrepancy between both of those champions as to really what they can contribute in the laning phase. On vision. On a lot of vision. It certainly is. Mammoth looking to try and make it two from two from these uh, very early game objectives. But this time, Pensanet will put up a contest. They had the vision, as you mentioned, and they have the members here too. Bajang acting like a Nautilus, but there is a Nautilus right there. So two hex flashes moving around the rift. Worth noting that Chan is not here. He's currently shoving in bot lane, looking for turret plates instead. It's a full commit here from Pensanet with Violet here in the mix. Rocket goes from downtown up across. Would they look for the steal? It seemed crazy. They should be quite content with a Jinx getting fed for free. Oh, the hook goes out. The hook does go out. That does force the flash. Instantly, Sully is decimated there by Dongy. Chippies turns around, hits the Ragnarok mode, and says, what on earth are you doing? You're taking a 4v5. Pentanet get the, uh, the Herald. They get the kills. They get a whole bunch of money. And I think the idea from Mammoth was a delay fight, right? To let bot lane just win. It could be three plates, it could have been four plates potentially just going into the pockets of Chayon, but once the hook missed, there was no other tool. This comes all the way back to draft conversations on how do you engage, right? You've got a Nico, you've got a Nautilus. So why is it that the engage is going to be a Kha'Zix jumping onto an Olaf? When there's a Lulu right there to shield him and ult him and keep him alive, you do not have enough isolated damage just yet for a bruiser like that. And the Nautilus hook wasn't going to be there to help. The Nico's not going to be positioned to help in that situation either, because neither of them were the ones to start that off. Just a little bit too much, perhaps, from Mammoth. As they still won through bot lane. Well, they certainly did. Um, not to mention all the turret plate gold, but the Carl is soon to be cashed in as well. Only 10 stacks to those remaining, but it does certainly even out the bot lane. Given the fact that Violet was fortunate enough to pick up two of those kills and now finds himself with a bounty on his head. And that's the sad part, right? Is Mammoth kind of opened the door for that trade to be really advantageous for them. The amount of money that those plates were worth is equal to the kills that Violet got. And they have the Herald to be summoned on their jungler ready to go. So the opportunity is there for Pentanet. You can see it's like 600 odd gold to 1,000 gold difference. That can get equalized in one good play. Uh, potentially by Pentanet, but it is Mammoth still looking. It is, it's a false flash, it's a hook, it's an isolated kill attempt this time onto Schoenfire, who's forced to run away. Whoa, Groif is like five seconds away! They've made it picture perfect this time, Violet. but across the wall goes Violet, flashing into action, finds himself a double kill, receives the ultimate, make it free now, Rusty, we're looking for four, it's only 11 minutes in, he'll be denied it. But my god, Pentanet are doing damage. I think a Lissandra passive ends up stealing the kill away from him, but fantastically done by the Aphelios and the Lulu. They wait for their cooldowns. Top lane is going to have a little bit of a biff in a 1v1 as well, but another fight that Mammoth choose to take and another fight that Pentanet walk away with with a very fed carry. Flashes forwards. It's the Graves they take the play towards. Still takes a while to actually get him down, so the Jinx has to flash forwards. And the Jinx flashes forwards into a Lissandra ultimate that has a purple weapon of Helios just around the corner. And so those kills come across extremely quickly. And just like that, Violet has the confidence, has the Lulu ultimate off cooldown at that point. I mean, Mammoth went all in on that one kill and they were made to pay. Yeah, it's back-to-back -back fights now. They've had some pretty dire consequences. And the fact that you can give somebody of the caliber like Violet five kills only 12 minutes in on a signature pick like this, 
He's already come back to laning phase with a Storm Razor and some change. There is the Gravitum, there is the ultimate. Two members rooted in place. Pounce upon his head. They need that bounty, but the Red Weapon is leeching. It's surviving, but the shot that eventually goes the way of Chan. That's where you need the gold to go. Zap will not be enough. The shield will prevent it. But third time lucky. But that was still really good from Mammoth, right? As an overall trade, you take that. You've got your first strike money into the pockets of Akazix. Jinx getting these kills as well. And Tyrone is still going to be a very prolific feature in this game. It is ultimately becoming a battle of the, the carries in bot lane. There are carries everywhere in this game, but those are the two that need to stay alive. And you've seen what's possible for Mammoth when things go right, when they get those kills, when they find their target and find their mark. This is going to be a very interesting game for the next couple of minutes. These objectives become more important. These items start to get completed, particularly on these AD carries. The Star Trek is, of course, <laughs> The minions attacking really quickly, Skibby. A little bit fast. What's going on there? Quick math check on the rift as you uh, see how many minions should be there. Well, there is the Herald finally being summoned, and it has to be in the bot lane. Ooh. Quick checking with top, and it's a flash from Chippy's looking for the axe. Cannot find it onto Tien, who was in gamer mode. Chippy's used flash and ghost for that and doesn't get the kill. Tien can just go back to base if he wants to now has the teleport and also manages to keep the flash himself and that is with Drake up. So this is one of those situations where it looks like Mammoth could contest the Drake given that they could have numbers here faster and Chippies is still showing top with zero mana. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't seem like they're going to contest just yet. Uh, and Tien teleported top lane instead. He certainly did, right back into the biff of things, and right down to 50% on his HP bar once again. Really just trying to keep Chippies in place, and I suppose more than anything, punish the fact that he does not have that TP available to him. It is one of those tempo stemming decisions, it felt like, from Mammoth here, because that's one of those drakes that we're kind of looking at. Ghost Blade's done for your Karsix, item spikes are there as well for your Jinx. If you get a flank angle from a Kasante ult or no, he's going to be a factor, and they would have numbers but they choose not to take that fight. Uh, protract the game just a little bit longer, now gonna be one Drake apiece. It's nice to see top laners fight, isn't it? It is a lot it's more nice exciting rather it. than just force the farm and say, well, if I leave lane, I, leave, I lose lane even harder, and then it's not a pretty picture. Those item spikes are starting to come through, as you already mentioned. Ghost Blade by both junglers. Difference in the bot lane was the Storm Razor versus the Kraken. Mm -hmm. Difference between what do you want? Squishy damage, a bit of movement speed boost, or the ability to shred through some very rather tanky targets. So it feels like the Kraken Slayer is there to one tap the Olaf, or the person that gets caught, of course, uh, by the Nautilus and the rest of his team. Also, note that I think this is the first time we have seen the Ghost Blade purchased since the changes to the items. Uh, it's an energized item in a sense now that at 100 stacks you become an absolute monster for 3 seconds of DPS with bonus lethality that is an insane amount. And so assassins can even do serious damage to tanks every single time that it procs for, those, for that 3 second period. Yeah. Which works really nicely with both First Strike and Kha'Zix uh, as a design. Not going to be a Dusk Blade that makes him invulnerable though, so it is still quite killable. Second Herald, and once again, every single member of Pentanet are here to guarantee it. Primed and ready to go. Our Mammoth also in the area hunting at any kind of scraps, but this time showing a great deal of restraint and not deciding to actually pull the trigger. One of those situations here where once again Mammoth will kind of posture for the objective but not commit themselves to that one. Pentanet seemingly like the team right now, they kind of want to keep the tempo up, they want to go for these objectives, they want to force these fights. They're looking right now in top lane. Hard to kill a Cassante, but four people? I mean, it might be enough if they get here. Certainly could be. They're He's going to try gonna and dash there. away. <laughs> and I mean, didn't even have to burn Flash, didn't have to get cradled with an angle to use the ultimate to try and bring him through a wall. It was just literally the case. So four members come at me, you've wasted your time. This is exactly what I was kind of talking about through the draft phase, where in terms of ease of execution, it is still a lot harder for Pentanet to get things done because it isn't that null fight top lane, right? It isn't that engaged with champion support. It's a little bit more finesse needed, and Shurnfire simply putting his head in top lane, not going to be enough damage against an armor stacked tank, you know, to get, to get that kill done. Yeah, just a lot of slows, right? A lot of soft CC. Yeah. So certainly easy said and done to try and say this is a guaranteed kill target in a 4v1 situation. 
Not yet. It does still. There is an Alessandro that you could recruit at any time to join the team in these fights. And again, that's going to be a large thing that you start to look towards. Violet about to cycle out of his Gravitum Cannon. But not going to have Purple Weapon if he chooses to auto attack another wave or activate it even one time. But you can keep it at, you know, two points and, and use it for an ultimate if you would like. Uh, but a lot easier to just cycle that one through. Minute 20 till objectives. It certainly is. It's a really good break point when you compare to the AD carries, you saw them both at the very top. And since we last checked in with them, there's a bit of a gap now between Chain and Violet. That does mean that Chain can get the Gale Falls just a fraction quicker. And then as a result, a fight is going to break out here in the top lane. Rocket from downtown, started to collect it. I mean, that's all you could ask for. Your Assassin gets the kill, your AD carry gets the assist gold, and you find a solo in top. That was kind of an insane Jinx ultimate when you think about how fast an Olaf with ult, ghost, and flash can move around, but they, they find their mark. I think maybe Tien coerces him into the area because he's looking for that one-for-one -one trade, but above all else, really nice gank from Mammoth. Really good opportunity found by Suli and Tien. They'll get their kill and don't even need to use the all-out mode from the looks of it. And a turret just simply drops. It certainly helps when you're running Demolish, and another target could be getting Demolished right now. Churnfire caught in position, Hook into Chompers into a depth charge, but he's already dashed away. Doesn't matter if they had the jump on him. He's a little bit too uh, evasive to fall down that easily. This has been such an interesting game to watch, Skimmy. It doesn't feel like either team's playing their perfect brand of League of Legends themselves yet either. Uh, it is a bit scrappy. And that's through not just the champions, right, but the decisions. Uh, it feels like is the number one thing. Sully, of course, with that W Evolve now, can start to position himself like this around his Jinx. Helps Nautilus hit hooks, helps Cassante find angles, helps Nico find those E's as well. Good opportunity for Mammoth to then group up as five and perhaps look for those fights. Pentanet, however, I don't think they back down from opportunities like this unless they absolutely have to. They certainly don't. Darjon Cos playing right now as the Karzix jumps in. Two men ultimate instant cleans and a dash away from Violet. Turns around with the Hexagon to Maiden. Uh, rather the Moonlight Vigil, I should say, and actually just gets the kill on towards Hex Flash. It's two so far found here by PGG. The Dragon is still being engaged. Is that the last thing that they can find? It is indeed a leap and a flash away from Sorley who guarantees it with the smite, but they will lose three just for Mammoth to stack up to. And once again, what feels like a, a team of Mammoth half saying fight, half saying do the Drake, uh, will, be have to, will be something we have to look at when the replay comes about. Uh, because they do get the objective, they do get out with their both jungler and AD carries lives intact. Darjong looks for the engage, he's postured aggressively with the Nautilus. They are looking for this place, Suli's there. But once the engage comes across, Chayon's dying to the Drake, he's not attacking in this fight, he's not contributing, and Suli not really finding an angle or a way in. Pentanet just kind of played front to back. You want to go forwards, you want to engage. Well, the Olaf's just going to press ult and chase you down. And for the carries of Mammoth, they just couldn't find their in. So it's a dangerous prospect when you can clearly see that it's a race to try and remove the Eddie carry very quickly into these fights. If they live, well, their scoreline looks a little bit like what you can see right here. Seven and one now is the Aphilios. Violet's starting to get a fraction too strong. Since the Edge of Night now is complete here for Sully. Yeah, isn't going to go for the Prowler's Claw just yet. Prioritizes having a Spell Shield. Things that can pop that Spell Shield actually quite difficult to apply. You've got Graves with a W. The Q obviously is going to break it right now, but when it comes to poke battles, uh, it does mean the Lissandra can't just go, right? It can't be a Flash W or a Flash Ultimate onto him. Yeah. And a lot of this Kha'Zix build is kind of posturing and poking by throwing those spikes out. So, not a bad choice. Still is going to be Lethality after all, but also has Boots of Lucidity. So W Spam is probably going to be the name of the game from Suli uh, from here on out. And then looking to assassinate Violet. One misstep from an Aphelios, a Lulu perhaps not nearby or busy. Still has the damage there. Chayon caught. Yes, yeah, certainly is being caught, and it's a flash away as he jumped on in with the Gale Force Gravitum. Look to try and get the Isolated kill over his former teammate, not to be found here in the mid lane. It's in John Starshunk. It's a triple ultimate. He finds a shutdown, but he served them up on a silver platter for team fight success. Appy has limped away somehow and some way, and Sully is unable to get much more done in that team fight. And Chippy simply being in the area saves the day here for Pentanet, but Darjong finds his angle, he finds the engage, the proto belt gives him the space that he needs to get a massive ultimate off. 
Not going to do anything substantial, however, for Mammoth or for Pentanet. When the dust settles 22 minutes in, we'll watch this skirmish one more time. Chaeyoung gets engaged on it. It's a purple weapon. It's a Gale Force forwards. He flashes away. Nautilus just tries to disengage and flash, but they chase past using all their abilities, and they open the floor here, and they get that initial kill, that shutdown onto the Aphilios. They get a third. Oh, sorry, a second. They look for a third, but then Olaf shows up, equalizes the play, and makes things a little bit better for Pentanet and Skimmy. Look at the gold difference, 22 minutes in. It's dead even. This really does almost ring true to our predictions of uh, rather indecisive desk as to what do we think the scoreline should be. It, it feels like a 1-1. I mean, this feels like a very even affair right now, and it is a big battle as to who can come out ahead in these individual skirmishes, and certainly feel like we're gearing ourselves up for a decisive soul point fight or a massive contest at the Baron. This is definitely one of those situations where it feels like the winner may just be the one who sets up for the play better because the execution seems solid across the board from either team when the setup is there. Pensanet going to be going for the Baron buff. You can see Tian on the flank, Stooley in the mix. They're looking for Violet and Stooley is, as you say, looking to try and make it happen. Tian right now has gone all out mode and looking to try and find a Dajun. Jumps Ooh. in with the pop blast and he's locked them all down! That was beautiful! Dajun take a bow, they have found four, and instead Baron is not on the menu for to you today, it's for us! And Dajun simply says, four new carries on my team, do not forget about me. Wow. Do not forget about the one remaining member in this squad, huge Nico ultimate. Nice try starting the Baron from Pentanet, gets completely countered. And just like that, Mammoth will get the fight, they'll get the Baron, they'll get to walk away very comfortably in the lead here. Tien gets very much caught out of position with this Polymorph, tries to ult the Olaf to create some space, but Olaf is unstoppable. And you're thinking this is a pretty solid start for Pentanet, but they chase once again just a little bit too close. Bit of Icarus gameplay from Pentanet, perhaps. The Sun is a Nico in this case, though. Yeah. Completely corralled or mind controlled by the low blinking HP target of a Cassante. Fell victim to the invisibility tactics of a Nico. And still, you can actually see through a lot of this vision acquisition that he's getting and space that he's creating, he's using his ultimate pretty aggressively to walk through spaces where perhaps they could have wards. But to see where people are is just constantly keeping them busy now, poking, harassing, and threatening. And even if Lissandra follows that one, right, she can't follow up because of the Edge of Night. So there's a lot of positive things here that Mammoth have going for them. There's a Hex Flash being used. Not going to commit to the play. Drake on the cards. It certainly is. What was a very dead even game only a couple of minutes ago now is uh, a 4k lead in favor here for Mammoth who are posturing and positioning and looking to try and guarantee themselves that sole point. And that's Infernal Drake number two with that down. Pentanet get a little bit more aggressive, feel a little bit more confident, decide to step up inside the enemy jungle. Not going to find what they're after. It might be forced just to lick their wounds and go back to lane. And since the change to Nico, where you can use your W and control the clone to, to jiggle around and look like a human, not a not a camouflage character. Very annoying. Bit of Shark Tech. Yeah. You're just seeing this Karzix jiggle back and forth. Like, that's an issue. <laughs> that's the Karzix player. <laughs> yeah. Not real, but that's an issue. Darjung, of course, is the person that you need to look at when these team fights happen. Mammoth threatening the mid lane outer. That's tower number three. That one has gone for sure. Dongy in a spot above it. Just gets leapt upon there by Sauli. A very delayed rocket comes out there from Chaeyon. By which point, Dongy is already far from the scene of the crime. But the utilizing that strength for the Baron, they've gone from top to bot to claim both objectives. And they're just opening up the map a little bit more for more of those flanking opportunities. And we also haven't really spoken about items much this game, but I think we should take a second in this little downtime to discuss some of the items that I think are quite important. Uh, Gale Force for both AD carries in this case as well, looking for that mobility to get around in these team fights. Makes a lot of sense. Uh, especially with how they're going to be playing this out. Lulu might be stuck dealing with a Graves or an Olaf to keep them alive. Violet gets to be a bit more self-sufficient. But the Imperial Mandate has been completed by this Lissandra. So all the crowd control that she's going to be throwing down, it's such a cheap item right now that it is so easy to just slam as your second item of choice, even if you're not a support, even if you're a carry. You know, 2300 of gold is nothing compared to the average item cost of about 3000. Uh, so he's able to get a very cheap item spike, which coincides quite nicely having two items for these mid-game skirmishes and fights that you've been seeing. Uh, and does mean that you know the rest of your team deals heavy damage when you engage. Certainly when you've got triple uh, AD threats, 
that can look to flourish as a result of that one. Dongi with the self cast of the ultimate. Dajung baiting with the clone right now. Dongi receiving the wild growth as a result. He is very susceptible to this damage so far. Death charge goes up. Ragnarok makes him go immune. Shunfire dashing, praying, hoping, but Olaf is dead. Tien's found his target, locked inside the mid lane. Finally, they've caught out Violet. He didn't have a flash. The cleanse is to no avail. Oh, Hook no. goes out, gets a different target because Dongi goes golden, and it is a decimation. As it's a triple kill, it won't be an ace, but they're marching towards the base. Uh, Doggy enters stasis and this faux wall that Shernfire thought was in front of him was never there. Mammoth will win this team fight seemingly out of nowhere, seemingly out of a pick that Pentanet tried to enact. You know, they were looking for Dajong, and just like that, 27 minutes in, Skimmy, they're knocking on the door. They're going for the end. They're going to say, look, this is the brand new face of Mammoth, a new roster, and a new way of reality. We will get wins, and they'll find one in game one. What a great debut from Mammoth, to say the least, right? They come in, they look fairly solid. It's a, it's an odd level one strategy uh, from Pentanet that definitely needs to be explored with the execution, but it was Mammoth that weren't hesitating, right, in that situation. They were the ones flashing the walls. They are a team looking for these fights and being very active around the map as well, and I think a lot of positives to commend uh, from the one game we've seen of Mammoth overall. 100%. I think one of the things that we've talked about in the past about Dajung's gameplay is that he did have a jungler on speed dial ready to try and gank his lane and get him fed. But it was a case of, okay, now that you are fed, how can you influence the map with that? We never really saw those big roams around the map or him sort of making the rest of his team strong. I guess it is byproduct of Nico is very strong, but he was landing some insane pop blossoms. <laughs> Yeah, well, we saw him like uh, land the the three man, yeah. and we're like, okay, that's probably gonna be like you know up the play of the day. And he like outdoes himself, <laughs> and he gets a four. And oh my god, even we heard you all the way back at the green room, Jimmy, <laughs> and both of us were also like, yo, what? Let's go! <laughs> it was good. It was insane. But this is uh, one of the fights that I kind of want to bring up because tell you like, okay, we we don't want Jinx to rotate. And we want to see like Mammoth sort of back off. Like that's going to be something that's better for them. And then all of a sudden they try and take that 4v5 and we're like, wait, what? We thought they had to disengage. I, I was so impressed at the fact that they like, oh, like, oh, five PG, PG members are here. Like we can just back off and just give them the riff. Like Jinx is getting free plays, like free gold XP on like our main carry. And then they just went in. And I was like, <laughs> why? It was so good. You were doing so well. Yeah, it was this uphill battle from then. I was like, oh no, is this the lead PGG need? Is everything going to be able to come online? And then that's when you were like, Graves, jungler, maybe if there was someone else, a different champ in the lineup, we could have seen this be a faster paced game, a more aggressive and uh, executed game from PG Team. Yeah, I, I wasn't really a fan of the Graves. Like, I understand it because Shunfai is known for his Graves. I thought that based on how they drafted, where they were taking away a lot of the mobile AD carries, you even saw like the Malphite hover from Chippies. They were thinking about diving. That if they did have that more team fight oriented jungle in like the Vi, Wukong, Maokai, whatever was left up, that they could have had more access to snowballing in the mid game with the Lissandra. Yeah, I actually do find myself agreeing with that. I mentioned it at least three times during the game, I think, as well, Dally. I was like, if that was a Malphite, like, it could be a different draft or yeah. identity from the team. Uh, and you can see a lot of the difficulties that they started to run into when it came to their team fighting as well, right? They, you're playing a Graves. One of your only real choices to fight is to walk forwards. Yeah. And now you're walking into a Nico composition that is just lapping that up. Do you think there was a timing in which PG could have done something else, sort of tried to be on the opposite end of the map, Rusty, where Mammoth weren't, or the way Mammoth were running, they were always going to be in your space. There was nowhere else you could occupy without running into this lineup of Mammoth. Yeah, it felt like Mammoth were definitely actively contesting everything. So whatever Pentanet tried to do, I don't think there was a solution of like cross mapping because mm -hmm. uh, Mammoth were just coming to you and forcing it. But a lot of it was perhaps around the execution, I think, more than anything else. Like, why are we hitting this Baron mm. that we know we're going to lose a 5v5 at when we know that Mammoth are coming to us? So I think there's a bit more finesse uh, that Pentanet could have afforded themselves. We can see the the gold difference, just how even it was. It was very back and forth, a little bit of a fluctuation, a little bit after the 20 minute mark, uh, PGG were coming into it. And then all of a sudden it was just this runaway uh, by Mammoth Esports Tally. Yeah, I, I, you could definitely tell that like one team would throw and then like, there'll be like a little bit of like an 800 goal lead and then they throw it back. But it was a very, very even game up until like, I think Rusty pointed out in the middle of the game, like look at the, the gold score, it was like 40K to 40K. There wasn't really much in it in terms of gold. It was just a lot about the execution. Mm -hmm. Anything that stands out to you? You mentioned the Lissandra build a little bit in the cast there. Rusty, do you want to break it down uh, any further about that one? If you think that 
it could have worked or maybe that's where the question mark is if a little bit of a different build on, on one of the champs could have also changed up in their execution. Uh, I was actually... I'm more curious what you think as well, Tally, because I like I get the idea of the Imperial Mandate, but this is one of those drafts where like Dongy has such a hard job in his comp that maybe even Zonia's rush instead could have been more valuable. Yeah, it's definitely it's like the same situation with when Swain was building Imperial Mandate. If you were in the solid AP position, you would still be going Leandries. Like you needed the damage output to be relevant. I think this was one of those games where you need the Zonias to like be that extra bit of engage for your team. Like you need to be building the damage items so. You can't just stack armor as the enemy team and just kill Violet, and he can't really do damage to you. Yeah. I think you need a bit more damage. I think to that point as well, I think we saw in that last highlight clip as well, there was so much pressure on uh, Dongy to try and find the engage that he's actually aiming to self-cast an ult, then receive a wild growth, and then be like, I'm done. I think there's that one last play we tried to get the Frost Nova off, just gets QSS'd out of um, by the Jinx. Obviously, Edge of Night's already there. So you're thinking, I've got all this pressure on me to try and make something happen so these triple AD threats can run in and be like, oh, Imperial Mandate, extra damage, and it just wasn't happening. No, not at all. It is, it is very unfortunate, but best of twos, you get the quick adjustment. That is the fun part about it. Um, and this execution aspect for Pentanet, do you try and just chalk it up and be like, okay, let's not focus too much on it. Let's just have a look at what the comp really needed. Um, is it just easy to fix and draft between games, Tally, or do you actually really need to take in the factor of it all? I think that PGG's draft, they had an obvious game plan, like they did win the level one like really hard, they just didn't commit to it and that's why they were unable to like snowball the early game. They had pretty much three lanes of priority plus like an evade jungler, which is quite insane to have in a competitive game. Uh, I think that if they're gonna commit to like not committing, mm -hmm. they should just go for the team fight. Like it's just really obvious, just pick more CC, be the better team fighter. But if they want to run it back, it's also a good option. Okay. Are you a little bit worried about uh, our 1-1 one -one prediction for everyone for the series? No, I think like <laughs> there was there was moments of like highlights like uh, like seeing Violet pop up in team fights like I still have faith like, in the one one. This is it. Yeah. Blood at the end of the tunnel, you know. <laughs> get to get to. They got it back. We got some from the fans as well. Maybe that's gonna be our light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, Buzz O says. By the way, I have really bad eyesight. So, uh, I mean, other than the obvious at Chiefs back to back to back championship run, it's gonna be the return of at Jake Lol and at Os Fruzy for me. Glad to see some absolute legends back on the rift. True. Legends is true. True. We're at that point where it's been so long that it's like there's more likely going to be a statue of them than a VOD recording. <laughs> <laughs> but I could say that because I played before both of them, okay? It's, it's been that long. It's good to have them back. I it agree. Is, it is called League of Legends for a reason. Yeah. Yep. Oh, They're the legends. True. We got another from the fans. By the way, if at any point you guys want to be shown on the broadcast, you two can tweet. Just use the hashtag LCO and we can pull you up on this broadcast. We got another one. Just want to see why not play Nidalee. I want to see that too. We saw Nidalee the other day, uh, the other day, but there's only been one other day. <laughs> Wasn't Why Not though? He did play a little bit last split, didn't he? Yeah, and he when Renekton was being played by Liv, so they played mm -hmm. it on a little bit of uh, speed dial. Then R.I.P. Prowler's Claw. Yeah, well, that's true. Then he mixed Prowler's it in with Claw. a bit of Elise as well. So he was certainly Rumble in the jungle if need be, but... Uh, I'm good with Rumble as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> bring Rumble back. I, I would it's love to possible. see a Rumble. Yeah. It's possible. Actually, that does work. I just sold myself. I'm sorry. <laughs> I want Rumble. Well, we, we don't got want... like his whole night plan. Like we did the top of show, and he's like listing all these chances. <laughs> oh, yeah, we, we, we don't. We don't want Morgana jungle. Though, oh, do we? we don't want that back. No, no, no. no we don't Morgana want jungle jungle's Morgana. cringe. No, Morgana mid is good though. Okay, okay Morgana, Morgana mid is good. Okay. Yeah, Zyra. <laughs> yeah, Zyra mid is good. Yeah, me, <laughs> only for Rosie. <laughs> He's a support. No, no, I'm saying for same for support. Okay. Yeah. We just jumped from mid to support. Let's jump on back to more from the back. Yeah, you guys are <laughs> this on. Couch is special. You, you only need to say like three words and you've had like a but, twenty thousand but. word <laughs> dissertation. <laughs> Return of a Cheon, the only pentakill of twenty twenty two against the Rays and the Chiefs, no less. Why'd you bring it up? <laughs> Why? <laughs> I forgot about it. <laughs> Had you blocked it out? Was Triggered. it just like yes. all the way in the deep recesses of the archive of like, oh, do like not I, resurface for any reason whatsoever? I can like vividly remember it. For some <laughs> reason, every time I play Corky, the enemy's playing Caitlyn Lux and I can't dodge Lux cues when I'm playing Corky. <laughs> I think I entered like four packages that game. <laughs> it, was, oh, it was just the worst performance, honestly. That was a good Penta. Yeah? yeah, it was, yeah. A, it was a great Penta. It was, it was a great Penta. It was a great one. Great yeah. Yeah. Memorable, was, memorable. Only the second one we'd had up at that point. I think, is it, it's Praetif, Praetif at the first, I want to say. I believe so. I think Praetif had a pentacle on Kaiser, then mm -hmm. it was that one, and then we had Raze at Dreamac. Yeah, yeah, we don't get many. We don't, many. we certainly don't get many. No, we might see, we might see some this split, you never know. Although, uh, Tally's not playing, so maybe we won't. Uh, we do have another problem. <laughs> 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 
while the pain away. <laughs> yeah, that's a great joke, Nana. <laughs> the universe Shinky Top. That's the return uh, for the split two that you want to see here at LCO. I would like to hear why. <laughs> I, oh. I would like Hoity oh. Toity to respond to his Another own tweet one. <laughs> with a hashtag and Another say hashtag. why. Yeah. <laughs> Shinky is a support player that has just switched to top. <laughs> Yes, well, that was something that we hadn't really touched on too much. Something I suspect we... it's because they're his mates. <laughs> no, I don't Just think so. Just a theory. Just a yeah. theory, a potential theory. Well, we can theorycraft a little bit more in our break because we're going to jump to one. When we come back, this best of two will continue. And Snack going to be going for the Baron buff. You can see Tian on the flank, Stooley in the mix. They're looking for Violet, and Stooley is, as you say, looking to try and make it happen. Tian right now has gone all out mode and looking to try and find a Dajun. Jumps in for the pop blast, but he's locked them all down! That was beautiful! Dajun take a bow, they have found four, and instead Baron is not on the menu for to you today. It's for us. It's not on you, that's on me, that's in my control, solid as concrete, I couldn't see it any clearer, before I look at you, I gotta see what's in the mirror, said I can be the very thing that she needs, that's right, treat her nice, sugar, not spice, that's guaranteed. Play this in the whip right now. Turn it up. Turn it up. Put some stank on it. Homies in the front, bass in the back. Ain't no time, ain't no worries at. Ain't no messing around. Ladies in the front, bass in the back. Ain't no time, you know where it's at. And you know that I'm down. You know that I'm down. You know that I'm down. Oh. 
Chippy is on an absolute tear right now. We haven't seen the end of Mammoth versus Pentanet just yet in this best of two. We've got game two coming up and uh, guys, elephant in the room, a misfortune ban from from Pentanet. Bounce off Rusty a little bit here, but I know in the past, like traditionally MF has been a really good pick into Aphelios, but like we haven't really seen it as of late as she's fallen out of the meta. But like, I guess with like the new Ida builds, like she could be an option and that's why maybe in practice, like people have been versing MF as the Aphelios and they want to ban it. I wonder as well, like, what exactly about the new items is it that, that MFs are enjoying? Because she's also had the most flexible build pass of most ADCs yeah. that exist, mm. right? Like, is there a Duskblade MF running around that just is invulnerable while ulting or something? Like, <laughs> like who knows what the actual tech will be just yet? But I think she does love the new items quite yeah. a lot. Okay. Um, there is also going to be that side swap too. We looked at it coming into this series, but... Um off the top of my head, who's Mammoth have red now side. picked red side. So whatever yes. it was last game, flip it. Flip it, and maybe the result might Buff be it. flipped too. <laughs> Bop twist it, it. twist, twist it, it. <laughs> <laughs> pull it. <laughs> there is going to be the change up on the side selection. So maybe you guys want to change up uh, who you want to vote for, and you can go do that. The dare fan vote all the way over there. Keep on pointing, Rusty. <laughs> Ooh, you guys whoa. can use your channel Skimmy's points. Skimmy's telling the time. <laughs> 3.30. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> Gonna confuse myself. <laughs> you actually might. No, because like, you know when you look in the mirror and you're like, but hang on a minute, I'm the other, I'm the other way around. And yeah, then, like, can you tell the time right now is 2.45? How would you do that with your hands right now? It's true. Uh, uh. Well, I... <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Chatting. Great job, 245. <laughs> I definitely got that one, Skimmy. Um, Embarrass myself on camera. Spec. That's a classic. Two words. Yeah. <laughs> two words, two letters. Um, you can go and vote for that. Uh, I, I'm trying to get back on track. You guys are derailing me so much more than Oops. I thought you would. No, it's fine. Welcome. Welcome to the LCO. Yeah. I don't know how Mac got through it. I don't know either. <laughs> I might have to call him up for a little bit of emotional support. <laughs> yeah. If I could get Mac on the line, buddy, how did you deal with these guys? I don't understand. Be careful. He will literally video call you right now if he hears this. <laughs> so. I don't have my phone, so. Yeah. He tried to call me yesterday. He I did missed actually. It. I missed it. He might be, it, he might in a couple of minutes be getting a voice. Uh, Maybe I need to video. turn my phone onto vibrant mode and just always be waiting for Mac. Yeah. He might actually join you guys in the cast because Champ Select's ready! Let's do it. Let's phone a frame, get Mac on the broadcast, and see what he has to say about this draft. Let's ask him very specifically about patch 13.10. We should. <laughs> and see what he has to say. What do you reckon about this draft, then, Mac? Yeah, mate. Good. It is, buddy. Good. <laughs> cool. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that. Well, it looks like we're basically running it back as uh, Aniko is. This is going to trade sides this time, isn't it? The Zeri is actually being let Zeri's through up. for the very first time. So, of course, you snap, uh, snap lock that one in and partner with the Karzix, which worked wonderfully. Yeah, so Zeri was banned on red side by Pentanet in game number one. This time they switched sides and Mammoth chose to get rid of the Lucian and Vi as a priority over you know, any of these other meta champions. They're willing to give away the Nico to pick themselves up the Zeri and a very curious draft will have to happen from here on out. Does Yumi finally rear her ugly head in the LCO because a Zeri has been locked in? Is Lulu prioritized? But now a Nautilus is locked in, it gets a little bit harder as well. Pentanet, I think, are going to stick true to their form scheme. They'll go much more aggressive, like the Jinx Nautilus style, but... For sure. You now know that you have to deal with this Zeri, this potential Trinity Force abuser as well, uh, with the new items that have come in and made her so strong. That's right. Trinity Force Runans then really go for wherever you like from that point onwards, right? It's become so tanky, but you're just pumping out so much cleave damage. It's a little bit too strong to contend with. But the Jinx, the Nautilus, that's locked in. That is a guarantee. The response from MF now becomes an interesting one. Do you fall victim to the potential flex of that Nico, or do you say, no, we need to guarantee our bot lane, and that seems to be what they're going to do with the Rakan. Rakan, okay. I actually, I will say that as far as feeling uh, is concerned, playing these champions, Rakan has felt so good since the change to support items as well. Not only are they cheaper items, but things like Echoes of Helia actually just sit so right on him. 
as a champion. Of course, you can still go for your standard items. Shirelias and stuff like that exist, but sure. it just it feels so good to have an Echoes of Helia as Rakan because you're dealing damage while also shielding allies consistently through team fights. That's healing you. Then your passive is healing you. So yeah, it's all adding up, right? And scales obviously phenomenally as well, much like a Yumi could do to try and emulate that sort of same level of success. Uh, second rotation of the bands. Mammoth going to open up by targeting that top lane, removing the Scion first and foremost. Pentanet going to respond and say, no, Ari, another champion that we know that actually both mid laners, um, really popular for them to be that facilitator. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, get rid of some of the, the facilitative carries now that the Nico has been locked in as well. Try and limit the pool just a little bit in mid lane. Looking forward to this last ban from Pentanet.gg as well. Another mid lane ban would never be a bad decision, but Dajong does have a fairly uh, deep champion pool. He does have a, a lot of specific champions to him. Like, you think Dajang, you think Zoe, you just can't escape that combo in your mind. But yeah. these are the two, like, you know, between Syndra and Ari, they're the two most staple uh, options that exist. This what he slam locks into Kiana and Akali, and we go, yep, that's I Dajang. Mean, yeah. You know, there's still the things like the, the Gragas Kassante that can be flexed in, but Kassante obviously going to be banned away, but those things do exist. Uh, <laughs> is that a Dajang champion, though, is to be questioned still, as we know that Tian can play it. You saw his hover for a hot I did, second that's why there. I laughed for a second. Oh, come on, give yeah, us the pocket pick ribbon. It would be nice, but it is blind. Yeah. Uh, and so the Gragas, I presume, is locked in for top. You're still looking at things like a Lissandra that could still be considered for mid as well. I uh, wouldn't be mad at that. Orianna, actually, still not a bad choice. I don't mind Ori into things like Nico. Now there's no shielding and whatnot. Your burst can be quite useful. But Liss is nice because you can also pre-ult the Nico. So you can self-ult if she's ulting you, or you can stop her from getting to your team. And this feels, uh, once again, a lot more akin to what made Penton as such a threat to really deal with um, in Season 1, right? Just the diving Ooh. attempts. Obviously, Level 6 is so, so strong, but you, you can gank literally anywhere and any time. You can have that scaling threat as well. It's now up to Mammoth to utilize their red side counter pick. Oh, this would be so advantage. good from Mammoth, though. Tien is a poppy player. He's one of the few top poppies that we have. He's also very good on the pick. Uh, this would be funny. This, this just simply is funny. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Chippies. <laughs> Look at Chippy smoke. It's like, uh, imagine, has he done that to me? I will, I will, small disclaimer for everyone at home, pro players have to have egos, right? <laughs> if you want to be the best of the best in your region, you have to believe that you are. And Chippies is the best Olaf that Oceania has, always has been. Yep. And now just the audacity, <laughs> the audacity <laughs> to just in your face. Hey mate, this ain't no scrim block. I'm going to do it on stage. Like, you have to imagine that the thoughts going through Chippy's mind right now is like, you're done. I don't care that I'm an Orn and I've been put onto it's this personal. tank and you've gone for this Olaf. I don't care. Oh my. Gang top level two. Here we are. Start top level one. The poppy would have been good. It really would have been good, right? It was that pocket pick. I mean, I say the word so loosely, but I mean, certainly Tien has a few, um, you know, tucked away for those rainy days, but the Olaf to come out like this in this situation, just feels like such a personal vendetta. It's like, you didn't have a fun time in lane last game, did you, mate? So let me show you how to play it. <laughs> this is how you... Oh, man, if he shows him that this is how you play <laughs> Olaf tech, where you, you beat it and then you beat them with it, I'd feel bad for Chippies. Oh, I, would. I, would, I would feel bad for Chippies, man. But still, that does mean, and like, like we were saying as well, the Poppy utility, the reason it's so good is it stops the Orn from getting engage angles. So what, what the Olaf provides is... I think the simple way to explain it is it's a more selfish version. Like, you get to survive and stay in the fight and be a carry, right? Like, a Nocturne can't fear you if he ganks. Uh, a like, Orn can't knock you up. Nico can't knock you up. And Nautilus is essentially rendered useless. Chomper, uh, Zap, doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah, you don't exist as a Nautilus into this Olaf, so the Jinx is in jeopardy. It's at risk. And can get to the back line, right? But harder to execute. Has the Kha'Zix to work with us, not the Wukong, something that was mentioned between Gabe Skibby. So, a lot of the focus, once again, comes down to the bottom lane. And it certainly does. It is a bot lane meta for a good reason. And uh, that is really where we felt to see, well, a whole bunch of the fireworks really start to pop off. And Azeri has been let through for the very first time. This split in the hands of Cheon. Let's see if he can dazzle us with another terrifying performance with it. And you can't help but feel like as well, straight out of the gates, Mammoth get the win. Mammoth have kind of shook the nerves off, perhaps, right? They're not going to be feeling them just as much. They've proven they can take down what was a top four team mm -hmm. in split one of the LCO. The and they can go toe-to-toe -to -toe in team fights. It wasn't perfect, but it was more than good enough. And it was Darjong that gets it done as well. So think about all the rust that he's just shaken off. 
Hoping to see a very confident game two from Mammoth, but it is Pensanet who, all things considered, I don't know about you, but I do really like their composition. I think that is a stellar composition for, for killing a Zeri and dealing with a Kha'Zix and making things very difficult for Mammoth. I certainly agree. Feels very reminiscent to Violet Comps of old, right? Where you'd sort of just farm up a storm, group up for one big team fight and say, ah, oh, we just win now. We're a little bit too fair, we have a little bit too many tools. Uh -huh. And I can just Mechanics Max on you. So let's see if it really plays out in that kind of a fashion. Obviously, the Nocturne is going to be the uh, the highway to get to that point of the game. Straight in before the wave is able to be hit. Tian perhaps trying to keep Chippies away from the experience. You can see that he took a lot of extra damage there. Just to step forwards to make sure he got that experience so that he doesn't lose out on level 2 and just die. Uh, but Olaf makes your life a nightmare in top lane. At level 1, he's one of the strongest champions in the game from the axe that he can just throw out constantly. When you're a tank with one spell, it's probably not going to be enough to go toe-to-toe. -to -toe, so, a little bit of bullying early. Nice hook. There is a bit of bullying. Look at that. The hook passive into Zap, and Cheyenne finds himself losing a major chunk of health. Quick point before we do deter our attention elsewhere is the fact that Tien is going to be running the teleport as opposed to the flash that uh, Chippies ran last game as the Olaf. So mm -hmm. that is the more stock standard, you'd have to say. Certainly is. Uh, especially having that ghost with it instead of the flash. There's no Jarvan or something that's going to really ruin your ability to move around in team fights or in a team composition. Dongy, of course, showing once again, and I don't think we've seen a game where this hasn't been the case, that Nico's push is just too good. Gragas does sustain pretty well through it, uh, as Thongy now gets to dress up in his best Nocturne attire. And have a look bottom lane, this is a big wave crashing. They'll see the Nocturne, they don't know that that's a Nico just yet, they will now. Yeah, they certainly will, this looks so akin to classic PGG, four man dives in the bot lane, forcing out resources, if not, your HP is so low that you're basically zoned from the wave and the play was a success anyway. I think maybe that was the major focus going into that second drive, right? Was give Dongy a bit more agency to actually play the lane and rotate and roam. Let him facilitate, right? Let him be a part of the team. Of course, he gets the Nico, so I don't think he'll ever be complaining. And look at the wave that he has for himself in mid as well. Great timing. The biggest win from all of what just happened is the fact that Dajung teleported without basing before it. Because he just goes straight to bottom, half HP, now has to base and come back with no teleport. Dongy still has his and gets to collect that wave. So in terms of timing, that was exceptional from PGG, exceptional from Dongy. And really cements himself, you know, this winning position in his own lane. Because he can trade with this Gragas and still have the teleport in hand. Begs the question then as to what we'll see come as a result of that uh, tempo advantage. Resets for the junglers, both coming to the same position again. The engage starts off, in jumps Hexflash, looking for the knockup, finds one, finds what they're looking for. And then the junglers say hello to one another, so it's a split fight between all of them as the fear connects and Sully's in trouble. A flash on instead of trying to get kill confirmed, try to look for first blood. And it is successful in just that. Shunfire limps away so, so low as are the rest of the bot lane here for Mammoth. It's only one kill, but there could have been so many more. And Violet just ran himself out of mana, actually gets the level up to get some mana back. Oh. Top lane, there was a flash used. And bot, they're diving. They are certainly diving. There's Zap, the flash! Oh, into the arms of Shenfire, and uh, Chen is now saying, where do I go? But the juggling of the aggro with a ramped up tower is perfect. And Pensanet.gg, looking like a team possessed in game number two. They recognize where things went wrong in game number one. And they say, Mammoth, just a blip on the radar. Let's go back, all stations go. And they are looking like an absolutely fantastic team with their early game well and truly back online. Certainly is. I mean, how many times did we see last split Pentanet do this where they would just dive you and they would switch the aggro beautifully where everyone would get away. No one would fall down for the play. And now in a much stronger start. It all starts once again with Shurnfire on a champion where you need to be ahead to get level six to now continue that momentum. And you're looking at the one place on the map right now that is very much winning for Mammoth. That is really it. You look at this hook back down in bottom lane. Shurnfire is on his way in. They had Sully here, and then he recognizes that Shurnfire is going to be a pretty prime target. Uh, jumps forwards, gets fit, and has to flash himself out to safety. And while Appy flashes forwards and doesn't quite find himself in range to auto attack and stun, he hits the tide, you know, presses E, slows them down, allows the kill to happen, then gets the hook onto another carry. And we said that top was winning for Tien. Surprise. <laughs> I don't know how we got here, but... That's a slight shift. It's not anymore. 
I was going to say this is the place that you probably just bring Shonefire up during his clear and, and equalize the lane so you could get the reset off. Still a significant CS advantage for that Olaf, but Chippies affords himself a base. He certainly does. You can see the observers toggling between all three lanes right now, and it's just carnage. Really in favor of Pentanet finding push, finding pressure, and finding the ability to do as they please. Look at the CS difference in mid, just quietly. You know, we spoke about how important that teleport advantage was before. I think you're now starting to really see the tail of the tape here through the CSD in mid lane right now. Dongy's had his way with it. He has a teleport advantage. He has priority in this lane permanently, and, and Dajong's just stuck being harassed, being poked. Struggling to deal with it, of course, if you didn't know, Nico can press recall and the animation continues. Character does not disappear, which is why you've seen, I think it was yesterday, Kisei did address his, his ally jungler. Yeah. Uh, to make them think they were basing in the bush. A lot of creativity from Nico. He certainly is one of those champions where attacks has to be paid as you almost relearn the game. And that pressure won't be settled for just claiming the very first dragon of the game. They got the first blood. They'll get your denial of the first reset of a blue buff as well. The fight starts. The lights go out. The uh, attempt goes into the bottom lane. And they try and hand this kill across towards Violet. There is the first one. Make sure they get the second. Well, that one goes across the Dongy. Both carries on the score sheet. Both carries. Very happy. Really wonderfully juggled with turret aggro as well. Stooley has no opportunity to help the rest of his team. No opportunity to defend the turret. They'll get plates, they'll get kills. If a Nocturne ultimate succeeds, he's now a 3-0 and two Nocturne at that. Put yourself in a Chayon's boots for a second and you probably shudder at the thought of the next couple of minutes when that comes back up and available and a Mythic gets completed. Things looking very rough for Mammoth. Eight minutes into this second game. Jug Jug. I'm just immersed in the ASMR of this top lane matchup. The fact that you know, Tien is this far ahead individually, that sort of beacon of hope in this ego matchup, if you will. I guess the question is how do they use it, right? How do you utilize this Olaf being ahead when the enemy team still has an Orn that will still be able to do a lot and is getting experience? And when the rest of the team can just come top lane and you die, right? It's going to be quite difficult to play. And, and you can see right now they're trying to use him. They've gone for the Rift Herald. Doesn't seem like Penson are going to be contesting this one by any means. But it does also mean that Nocturne, you know, 30 seconds on the night on the ultimate to be back up and available. 20 seconds now. Would not be shocked to see him pass towards a stacking bot wave and just dive that. On repeat. Yeah. Break the turret, open the game. Herald means nothing then. Well, the timing could be perfect. I mean, 17 soon to be uh, less on the coal stacks remaining. Already a massive CS advantage. A huge gold injection already has been found. Suddenly you find yourself a full item advantage ahead. They want to get this red buff before they go for the play. Dongy also could even be pathing down if he wanted to. And there was a world where this dive happens. They're still potentially looking for it, but they're not going to have their Nico, And they're not going to have a completed item for Shurnfire. So I feel like the idea was there. They were thinking what I was saying. But they've delayed their execution by two, if not three waves, and now Mammoth also know that it's a possibility. And they'll get their level sixes for it. That's Ooh. a crazy hook. That's a cheeky hook. One that I didn't expect to land right there, but Appy has paid so much damage as a result. This one, in goes Shonefire, makes it work, forces it to work, says it has to. And Cheyenne, by some miracle, does not die to the explosion. <laughs> that was an absolutely insane hook. I think the fact that that was successful yeah, Rakan going down with both Flash and Ignite, ready to be used. Those raise some eyebrows. Yeah, Appy should have been punished for it. I think a one for one was certainly possible there, but didn't expect the, I guess, the sheer damage that came out of the Nocturne from the side. You know, the peripheral vision KO. I will right, we'll see this one more time. Just watch Appy hit the hook. Yeah, it's a little bit crazy. Uh, it gets immediately comboed, right? And probably should just die. But then bang, Jinx ultimate combo with a Nocturne landing at the same time. Yeah. Couldn't do much there, right? Could have perhaps flashed. Well, yeah, I mean, buff is the flash as the lights go out. No ignite, no range. No ability to try and answer back if any more damage is Tarjong. Oh, I tell you what, that is very fortunate to still be standing there. Night and day performances between these games as well from pretty much everybody on the Rift right now. We're going to connect one more time. Shurn fires here. He certainly is, and Soli is the focus. Just going to leap at a range of those chompers to let us CC one after the other, but full control of the rev. Very hard for Soli to find impact. 
Might be invaded here on his Gromp, but it is going to be successful. They're still going to try and march their way inside this tri-bush. No, it's just bot lane. It's constantly bot lane. The pressure there is just insane. Gragas has no teleport. Tien does uh, and is actually free to do so right now if a play were to happen, but that also means a demolish proc and a potential top lane turret in shambles. This is one of those situations where the map is just... There's been an issue presented to Mammoth, and we're not seeing a solution anytime soon. Every single time Nocturne Ultimate is up, they bring Dongy down, this happens. On repeat, it just keeps working, and if it doesn't stop, then they're just going to continue to do it right now. So they find their kill onto Chair, and that makes it death number three. That makes it zero and seven as a combined bot lane. And finally, that bot lane tower will fall, and this gold lead balloons just a little bit further. Just play safe. Just play safe, guys. <laughs> yeah. I think you'll be right. Just play safe, guys. It'll be fine. That's when your mental really boosts. <laughs> a Nocturne ultimate at the same time as two teleports. Simultaneous teleports from Bentonet. They have said you do not get to play League of Legends in this bottom lane. They're double the CS. If you look at Violet and Chayon, he's almost double. He's only just collected a couple of farm there, Chayon, to keep himself ahead of that double mark. Our full turret is gone, and this Jinx is about to be weaponized and unleashed on Summoner's Rift. Close to double with the gold as well, as you can see as we toggle over. You know, it's a uh, very scary reality to see just how strong this Jinx will be in comparison. Silver lining for Mammoth fans will be the fact that they did get a rare chance to then uh, put some siege attempts into both top and mid, still whilst these turret plates are remaining. So a little bit of gold to try and claw it back. You could be absolutely terrified if they do decide to group up. He's pensing it for a fight. I think we have learned what the problem is. And it's Nico. It just wins. It truly does just win. The interesting question to me is, you know, is there a ban that is currently being thrown out by all of these teams that they deem is more important than the Nico right now, who is clearly, clearly running away with it? Especially given the priority to both teams opt for the red side and say you can have the Nico. Yeah. Both teams have willingly given away this pick and both teams are suffering at the hands of this pick. Yes, Pentanet also changed their composition in a big way, in a very positive way. Tien actually looking. Oh, the ball indeed. Yeah, they just jumped straight in. Yeah, Tien tries to be a one-man wrecking army. It's just not going to work in that fashion. <laughs> big smile on Chippy's face. Like, I don't know really what that was. Hexflash tried to make it work with the quickness too, but Nowhere near strong enough at this point in the game. Sully ulting his way into mid lane, trying to get some distance and cover some space to get himself the Donkey, but not going to be able to find that one either. 10 to 0 is the scoreline. 2 to 0 in Drakes. 2 to 0 in Turrets. So far, a total shutout bar, I think, a Rift Herald uh, that they were able to secure. And Hex Flash going for that play top lane used his ultimate and just simply didn't go to the Olaf to help him at all. Uh, until the Olaf was dead. His assistance was kind of an afterthought and Tien throws himself to the Wolves. And they feast. Might have been that one push, that one source of inspiration given how far ahead he was in a individual matchup. But unable to capitalize on it, unable to find any way back into this game. Still searching for their first kill, our Mammoth here in game at number two, despite being 1-0 up in this series. And really, I suppose at this point, you start to talk about what do Pentanet do, it's about a clean closeout. How is it that both of these teams ended up with the Ola? <laughs> is my question. It's interesting how he got there. Chippies is back to his horn, however. They are hitting the Rift Herald. 15-minute fight from Mammoth down 6,000 gold. Very unlikely, but can't go to a side lane anymore because a Nocturne exists. And a fed Nocturne means you, you are in illegal territory if you're in a side lane because you just die. Yep, fed is an understatement. It's the 7-0 no Nocturne. It turns the lights off once again. There is paranoia, and you are feeling it right now. Paranoia, anxiety, and absolute jubilation at the same time. It's all muddled and mixed together. It's a double kill here for Dongy to start things off. Nico is simply broken. The Herald is used in the mid lane as well. That adds a sixth element to the strength of what makes PGG so strong here in game number two. And now they are chasing down the final straggler <laughs> as Darjung is doing a little bit of alcove gaming. He's just juking left and right. Oh, he's going to use the blast gun to go south. The Dukes have stopped. There's a body slam over the wall. He's been tagged up, so we can't deny anymore, but he's running away. So Shenfire, you're not allowed to get me. Nah, keep chasing. 
It's a battle of egos now. You can't just let him get away like that, can you? Collapse is coming through. Doggies, he's going to teleport. They can't cancel the teleport. He cannot tether the E over the wall. <laughs> Mischief managed. Dajak play the night. MVP. <laughs> they got play the night in both games. That's just so easy being Dajak, isn't it? <laughs> but that's a consolation prize. We are sitting here celebrating the fact that one of them survived. Excuse me. After that fight, you watch this one more time. And again, I don't know if Mammoth have a better choice than going for these 5v5s. But in the face of a Nico, in the face of an Orn and a Nocturne, they just turn the lights out and they counter punch, and it's just an uppercut, and you are done for. As we can pretend the rest of it didn't exist, Shonefire, don't worry. In the replay, you killed him. It happened. Well, one turret is matched to the one kill that Memo found right now. They'll be hunting to try and find more, but a single ultimate there from Dong in. The rocket across from downtown comes in to say we will still showcase why we are close to 10,000 gold ahead of you. Yeah, Shopify is going to die. This 7 0 Nocturne is no more, but Chippy Sansa's back finds one. The second connection of the Choo Choo train gets a double. The Choo Choo train. That's what I'm calling it now. <laughs> Fair enough. Oh, he steamrolls them, so... Look, two kills into the pockets of TN. He got what he was after. Absolutely. They make something happen. They're keeping the map moving. They're trying to stay as active as they possibly can, but... I mean, history just keeps repeating itself. You try and make these desperate plays, and I don't think there's a better word to describe them. And just like that, there's a Nocturne waiting. They're constantly waiting to get you, and the, the counterpunch from Pentanet, with this comp being as fed as it is, is just a little bit too strong. Certainly is. You can just see really the biggest impact has been felt on that bottom lane, right? Just the difference between ADK Shen only now finding himself with the Trinity Force online to start to become the menace that has been known so worldwide as, what, many years at this point? How long has there been meta for? It feels like forever. It's not going to be space guiding through this game to try and farm up any pentakills anytime soon. Pentanet will go back to bottom lane and will find themselves an Olaf and will say, you can hit the Ragnarok. Fair enough. Cooldown burnt. We're still going to command the respect of this quadrant of the map. Runan's Hurricane is probably the break point that Azari needs to deal any damage uh, in this game. It'll be a good team fighting choice for her. You know, providing AD as an item now is quite nice. But at the same time, who's he going to be killing? Because if there's a Nocturne that he's attacking, then he's in kill range. Violet does ultimately end up being able to win the 1v1 against the Drake. Has the red buff there for the bonus health regeneration as well. And they just continue to push bottom lane. Oh. They find an Olaf. A disgusting little hex flash across the wall there on towards TN. And he's just dead for rights. Five members come together and say, we will win this skirmish. We will claim your base and we will take this inhibitor. That's exactly what they've done here, Rusty. Mammoth are spectators inside their own home, forced to watch and decide, do we really have a play left up our sleeves here? It's a 4v5, it didn't work in game one. Will it work in game two? Well, they're not gonna be forced to find out because Shernfire takes control of the situation and jumps into life to remove Darjon. There is the Pop Blossom again, onto one, fully removed, easy peasy, and one by one, single file. Mammoth are falling on down Hex Flash with a flash in for just a bit of a distant afterfall. Ooh. And finally, they do get Cheyenne once again. Tien's respawned amongst all of this. That's how quick these respawn timers are. Yeah, Tien will push it back from ending. <laughs> That's the consolation prize for Mammoth here. They got one prize target. They were looking for Violet that whole time. He started that skirmish at about half HP. He regenerated some of it. The turret then took him back down to half HP. And there is just a Kha'Zix stalking, waiting in the wings, looking for his prey. And they just used Violet as bait. They just dangled the carrot in front of Suli, and eventually he has to go. The rest of his team's dying. There's no way they're winning this 5v5. Chippy's with a fantastic Ornhorn, horn, and then Suli says, all right, better go. Can't. Just stunned, cannot move. The bait was successful, and Cheon, he's trying his heart out, but again, doesn't have the damage. And it's just so simple to be able to play this Nico, find your targets constantly with the flashy. Next flash says that's worth. Ignite gets the kill. Yeah. It does remove Violet eventually. A kill from the grave, but a kill nonetheless. And there was a glimmer of hope when you saw a few kills go the way of Mammoth. But once again, Pentanet are taking 
full control of the situation and putting it right back to where it Beast was, hooks. close to 10k. Hook does in fact go out. There is the full combo actually onto Darjeeling, isolated and flashing across the wall. Paranoia connects, in jumps the Rakan, tries to find a moment, gets denied there by the Ornship. He finds himself on a rampage right now. Make it two as he's sitting on a double kill. Orn can be a carry, especially when parted by this man here. Tien goes down, moved very candidly there by Violet. Burning double summoners to ensure that he can survive. We've learned a lot about Mammoth's fight or flight response uh, here, and that is fight your way out of every situation. That much has been made abundantly clear in this game. Pentanet will continue to push forwards, continue to win team fights. Second inhibitor short of fallen, supers in the base. It means they can threaten for the end here and now. And Mammoth, we know they fight their way out of situations, but this situation is a bit tough. It is a bit of a tough one to try and climb yourself out of as they've only got one next turret between them and that GG screen. So they're going to have to try, and that's exactly what they're doing right now. Chippy's the one potentially lagging behind, the one with the smallest HP bar remaining. The one they would love to try and pick apart despite being a tank. They slow him on down. In comes Dongy as a TP. He's a cannon. He's a cannon. It's a minion, but it's moving so fast. He gets the kill. Disrespect's all he did. Make it two as Shernfai gets in on the action himself. Dajong is flanking from behind, but he doesn't know where he's going. He needs a nightlight. He's having nightmares as there's a double kill there for Shernfai. This Nocturne with Chao double digits is an absolute demon. That's actually, they hold the fort through just sheer determination, just force of will, and they will stay in the game. A triple kill for Tien. He's now six and six. He's fixed his KDA, if nothing else. And Chayon survives to farm and hoover up all of these creeps. If he at any point steps away from that turret, however, and supers decide to get emotional, there are very emotional <laughs> creeps. They are very emotional creeps. They sometimes, they hate. They hate doing what makes sense. <laughs> they do. You watch this one more time, Celia will slow them down. And the fastest cannon you've ever seen comes in, go. ready for action. No one suspects the cannon minion <laughs> to fight. The fight again going the way of Pencil. This is like their third fight consecutively. You can see they're blinking health bars. Darjong just gets kited, but it's a huge combo here from the Olaf. I think his axe just went through all of them and just shreds three people nearly instantly. And close to a situation where Chaeyoun's able to actually get a wipe and get an ace, but looks still on dire straits. Soli, you absolute legend. They Full respect. They just got a salty nocturnal out. They just copped the salty nocturnal. As Tully's laugh, he's like, just a thief. That's one of those moments in comms it's like, yeah, nice soul point, boys. You remember the day you almost caught. Yeah. <laughs> hey, you tried to close it out perfectly. Not going to happen on my watch. And I, I do enjoy this brand of League of Legends that we're getting from them. We discussed this earlier through draft as well. And like an actual logical thing here is that you can't play side lanes into a nocturne composition, right? Mm -hmm. Not a 12 and 2 Nocturne either. So your only choice is to try and fight. And if you can separate the fights, right, get items advantages in this skirmish or numbers advantage somewhere, like maybe you get something. And that's really all you can rely on is finding something where there is nothing. And they are creating opportunities from, you know, constant tough decisions, I would say. There's no good decision, so it's, no. it's rude to say a bad decision. But it really is entertainment at its finest. It is certainly an uphill battle. It has been from the very get-go in this game. But Appy once again leads the line, finds the target, gets the hook and gets the kill. Cheon removed. He could have been that clutch factor. Now sitting on two and a half items. It does not matter. Tien also, a spark of life is removed. Also, incredibly early, and Ultraviolet kicks it up a gear and finds himself a triple. He would love to try and find more. Would love to tear up for some of those multi-kills. But the regeneration of a fountain, just a little bit too much as it denies that Quadra kill. Ultimately, Pentanet at 25 minutes in, settled the dust, and even at the score, showing the points one for one. And it does feel like the inevitable finally takes place. They will finally get the win that they were after. Pentanet.gg with a well-deserved Game 2 victory. We'll equalize the scoreline, give us our first 1-1 here in the LCO as well. So Mammoth, while they do lose that game, can still celebrate the fact that they get a point on the standings. And they did have fun with that second game, they right? They, they still showed us a lot of signs, uh, similar to what we saw from yesterday's games. There's things to look forward to with this team. 100%. There's reasons to be excited with this team, but tough start, and there was no recovering with that game. There was not. But there's a lot of personality, there's a lot of entertainment, and uh, can I just say, guys, look at our predictions. We're pretty, we're pretty clever. Yeah, I think chicken we're hands. Yeah, clever. good work, well good work, done. good work. Well, Get past well done, well done, well done. Yeah, chicken hands, chicken hands. Yeah, yeah. Pleasure doing business with the boys down next. Good work.
<laughs> little pat on the back. <laughs> anyway, wrap out the LCO. See you guys. Uh, see you next split. Should check no. out Maximizer's <laughs> scores real quick. Did he? Did he? Commit? No, he's the exact same as us. Okay. I think we're all. Yep, we're all the exact <laughs> same. Good. Good. Unity. So we easy. stand united. That's what it is. Um, but let's break down this game a little bit more. Let's have a chat about game two for the fact that Pentanet were able to be so dominant. Tally, blue side stats. We checked them out. Bro, tell us. It's, you won't believe it, but <laughs> after that game, blue side is six and zero in the LCO. Wow. Yep. So why are we picking red? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, picking yeah red? teams are coming in with their preference for the red side. It's a bit of an interesting one. Some great plays. I did like at the end, Mammoth really holding strong there, trying to defend the Nexus as much as possible. I was like, yo, this is the way in, Tally. Could they do it? Could they be holding it? I knew they couldn't, but I was helping that Copium. Uh, I mean, I thought it was pretty good, honestly. I, I, like, they finally did what I thought they should have done last game. They, they drafted, like, really heavy team fight, and they just gave Violet every resource they could. I think he had, like, yeah. almost 100% KP at the end of that game, and they were just give, they were just funneling him resources, and, like, when Violet gets resources, he will carry the game. Yeah, level 2 dives, level 3 dives, level 4 Nico dives as well, right? Every time Nocturne had ultimate. And I do agree, they kind of... They assessed game one, they came back and said, this is obviously the, the quick fix that we can make just to play our best yeah. brand of League of Legends. And you guys got another glimpse in what Pentanet are actually capable of when they're playing at their best. But mm. Mammoth made them work for it. Yeah, but very much so. That kill participation again. Do you, do you think that at some point it becomes rough just how much they're focusing on bot lane? Or are you like, this, this could honestly be pretty flawless. Like, how many teams can punish the emphasis they're placing on bot lane? I, I just think it's like, it's really important that you don't uh, allow the enemy to just play their game plan. The fact that they had like a uh, Nico and then you just pick a champion who cannot match the prior to mid, you're constantly getting poked out as the Gragas, you're losing prior. It's so easy for her to move down and you have the best engagement like Nola's Nocturne. It's just really easy for them to execute and you have no trade on the other side on the on. Like getting the Rift Tail doesn't really matter. You already lost like five plates by the time you're going to have any impact when that's all. It's it's just really hard, honestly. If you were in this situation, if you were Mammoth, do you put the Gragas top lane because you hadn't picked your top lane till last, and then you you pick a mid laner that can match the Nico? Yeah, like absolutely. You when you have the Kha'Zix, like you do want to pair like those two v twos or like the isolation, like just picking someone off, which is really good when you're constantly rotating around the map. So it would have been better to just put the Gragas top and just like handshake the tanks, and then have uh, either a mage who can lane well or just pick CC. I agree. At what point do we start banning Nico? Yeah, no, that was... I, I didn't want to bring Yesterday. it up. <laughs> Yesterday. Yesterday. <laughs> Should have already been Before banned. started. Yeah. I didn't want to bring it up because um, that's something that I really wanted to ask the mid laners, especially because, like, on the side of Mammoth, you kind of decimate with it. Like, you have a great showing, yeah. and then you know that they're going to be able to pick it up because you swapped sides, you, you changed this pick order, and it's not a priority for you. I don't know if they thought that they had an answer for it where maybe in scrims, maybe in solo queue, they're like, hey, I've come up against this in mid lane before. And it actually wasn't this OP feeling that we might be seeing in the LCO at the moment. This is one of those things that I think we can kind of talk back towards what we said yesterday, right? Where your options in the ban phase is to leave the Nico open, but leave open everything else. Mm -hmm. So your red side can actually pick two OPs yourself, yeah. right? And then you have more options where I think what we've been seeing is is not that, yeah. right? We saw a Zeri, we did see a Zeri pick, but then like they didn't follow up with this OP matching of the Nico in their composition. They kind of mm -hmm. just let the Nico go through and mm -hmm. then picked weird things into it that let it work. Yep. So kind of counterintuitive red side drafting. Well, look, we got the mid laner from our game number two winners. We've got Dongy on the line here. I'm gonna have a bit of a chat to him. Dongy, congratulations. <laughs> Even though it was a draw, congratulations on such a commanding second game there. How, um... Uh, how, thank you, thank you. Of course. Got to know about this Nico matchup. We're having a discussion here on the couches about why it's being let through, why it's not having that priority of being this first phase ban. Uh, for game one, I think we had some sort of draft autism. We had a lot of issues. We just gave everything for free. Like we're literally being Santa Claus in June already. <laughs> it's just definitely just on us, fucking up. Oh. No, no, you're all good. <laughs> Look, sometimes it happens. Sometimes yeah. it just lives out like that, you know? Um, was there anything to be said about the way that you're also executing the, the draft in game number one? Not necessarily just what you picked for yourselves, but did you feel a little bit lost, unsure what to do because uh, coming out of the draft, you're like, wait, what have we drafted ourselves? Yeah, as soon as I saw the first top three champion, Kasante, Kha'Zix, and what was the other one? Nico. Nico, Nico yeah. I, I felt I, I lost already. 
Like, there's really? no way to win this draft. There's, we gave three most OP champion in the game. And I don't know, we had all the bad champions on our side. Mm -hmm. But I felt really bad. And was that the biggest change up for you guys in game two? You just really focused hard on making sure you guys had the OP champs? Yeah, we basically just copied Mammoth draft. So <laughs> it felt a lot better. It's all right. So draft like right now, playing Nico is like, I don't know, there is no way to counter her engage. Like with our human like reaction time, you can't react to it. Like mm -hmm. Dota 2, you can use like Blink Dagger, like engage, you can't react to it, same thing. It's all right, draft if happens. I, I, I was actually curious about, uh, so both teams here picked red side, and I want to know why teams in O's have such a high priority in red side when blue side is having so much success. I think it's just oceanic, like autism. Like red side sucks, obviously. Like blue side is way better after playing today's game. <laughs> yeah, so it's our autism. It's better to find out sooner than later. Anything else you want to ask, Hai? <laughs> True. Oh. Oh, awesome. Dongyi, thank you so much for giving us some insight on what happened in game one, but also uh, the performance you had in game two. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, catch you guys. See you guys later. Bye. Bye. <laughs> well, there you go. We got one opinion. We got one mid laner's opinion on uh, letting Nick get through and, and some of the issues you might face. Truly an eye-opening interview. <laughs> Dongyi was unleashed, wasn't he? <laughs> to, to say the least, that was uh, he's had a... <laughs> He's had an eventful break. <laughs> he's refreshed, he's rejuvenated, he's forgotten, he's a pro player. Yes. Yep. Yep. If yep. I had to play against Cassante and Nico on the same team, I would probably be the same. <laughs> You'd be like, I don't actually want to do an interview and do not ask me about this Nico. I do not want to answer it. Uh, I do not even want to remember it. Pure nightmare feeling uh, over there telling. Yeah, I mean, that does, was just scary. Does seem like he's learned his lesson though, right? And you heard <laughs> it from him himself. It's not going to happen. We just copied Mammoth and yeah. we're not going to let that one happen. It's not going to happen future. again. Blue side's the best. than later. Exactly, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very much true. Um, also, I don't know why I keep saying very much. You do? Yeah, I just said very much true from the very end much, time. Very much true. Very much true. Very much true. I'm going to take attention to that. Yeah, now <laughs> I can't unhear <laughs> it. Yeah, anyway, thank God. I was just stalling until we got our second mid laner <laughs> interview. <laughs> Dejan, hey man, what's up? How you guys feeling, even though it was a draw? Um, I think the second game was a bit bit into, I'm not gonna lie. But yep. uh, I think it's an alright start. Um, we don't have Yosan yet as well, so um, I think we should have done better, but I think 1-1's fine. Yeah, one one's still really great. Um, just a super side note, is that wallpaper behind you? Or like, is that painted on? Like, what's going on with the background? So, the rest of my walls are white, but for <laughs> some reason, only that one's cloudy. So, <laughs> um, I think my mom did it when I was really young. Hey, look, it looks good. Yeah. I just wasn't sure. I, I would like, you know, I, I, I'm not sure if it was hand painted, if it was wallpaper, I just needed the answer. That was for my own sake, so thank you. Uh, another one that I need the answer to is this Nico mid. We had Dongy on before, and he was sort of explaining why they let it through. How come even though you guys won game one with it and you had a great performance personally, you were willing to let it through in game two? Do you think you had counters? Uh, yeah, I think we, we thought we had counters and um, there were other priority picks we wanted to trade. Like if they have Nico, we get X champs. And I think we were at the end of the draft, we weren't too unhappy about how it panned out. Um, Gragas wasn't originally going to go mid, but we felt like Olaf was an Exodia pick, which I feel like it was. But... Uh, bot side just exploded a bit too early with the mid prior, so mm -hmm. yeah, was because it, OP. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> was it the biggest downside for game two? How much priority Pentanet had on bot side and the fact you guys couldn't really react to it? Yeah, I think that was the biggest reason for game two. Um, honestly, I feel like I just walked around for 25 minutes last game. I didn't really do much. <laughs> Twiddling <laughs> the thumbs. Yeah, just yeah. doing things I'm like, hmm, this is a game of League of Legends, I guess. I mean, you stole my question. I was gonna oh, ask. Uh, I, I wanted you to be a bit more like intricate on why you thought like game two went wrong for you guys. Like, was it like the draft, or is it just like how the game panned out, or did you just feel like it was pretty much like based on how the lanes were going that it wasn't really a uh, game for you guys to play? Um, I think draft wasn't the worst. I feel like it was definitely still winnable. Um, I think if we worked around more with the fact that Nico is gonna have such early moves, um, my first TP bot I felt like really ruined my own game for me. So I think if we played around actually getting Nico like pressured, not letting her walk around the map for free, I feel like the game would have gone a lot differently. Mm -hmm. yeah. It sounds like you got some learning lessons. We'll see um, how you guys go for the future of LCO, but thank you so much for joining us here. No worries, thank you guys. See ya. All right, well there we go, just a mistake. Just, you know, 
I mean, a little less of a mistake on Mammoth's side. They thought they had some counters. They had uh, mm -hmm. more Exodia picks in their eyes of what was going to happen. But yeah. the Gragas question that we had of why did it go mid, very much answered. Yeah. I mean, you raised the point already about like the TP. You could definitely feel the tempo shift as a result mm. of that one, right? Then the, the Nico had a field day to do as she pleased. Um, and we were raising the point that, and as he said, they felt that the Olaf was an Exodia pick. It was certainly winning in isolation. But then when they had a chance to try and actually utilize it, that fell flat as well. So. I think um, they can't feel too deterred, especially when you know that you've got another player coming in to try and level up the roster even further. Yeah. To walk away with a 1-1 one -one with a top four team, not bad. Yeah, uh, and look, I would say those interviews were my personal MVPs of this series, but for you guys, uh, MVP. Ooh, uh, I actually, I think that Appy had a really good series. He's the did, unsung he hero. Did. Like his Lulu in game one was good and his Nautilus in game two was very good. I is agree. that what people will vote for? <laughs> or is that what we believe is our MVP? Well, that's what I believe is the MVP, but I don't know. Oh, maybe Nocturne? Uh, maybe Shurnfly will get voted for? He had a very good game, Support's too. But game got one was last night. Yeah. I was going to say, you remember, it's the best fans. of two, so you got to try and like... Violet's got fans. And Violet played well in their loss. Yeah. Yeah, the Violet fan And he had like, what, a 98% kill participation or something Violet. like that in game two? Yeah. Okay, so you've all swapped. You think it's going to be Violet now? Pentanet. Bot I'm going Appy. One of the bot lane. Appy's like, that's that's some of mine. No. Oh, okay. you got the Nico you what? got the wrong Nico diff. team. What? They love their game oh, one. They're still thinking of the montage. He, he got this <laughs> for the four man and three man ultimates in that first game, which were good. Yeah. Which were good. were good. You can't argue with it. But he also didn't play League of Legends in the second game. <laughs> he did say he was twiddling his thumbs yeah. for about 25 minutes. So this is a fun. I don't know if chat's going to see this one and be like, I'm indecisive with my own call here. Right? <laughs> it wasn't me. I wasn't a part of the majority. I was the minority. I wanted Abby. I wanted Violet. That's a tough one. It is actually tough to give an MVP in a 1 1 series yeah. as well. Yeah. Who's Either the team? most valuable? Because you've you got, you got lost to, ones. You got to hit the overall. You can't just yeah. look for the best play. Like, it has to be like who consistently performed the best in that series. Mm -hmm. Now, mate, Twitch trap. That's We're what we do. It's actually We're chatting. Time. Yeah. Chatting. They chatting. are chatting, yes. <laughs> a lot of it. Well, look, they can keep chatting between themselves Magga. because they're not going to hear from us anymore. We're going to be jumping Kick to a dub. break. We do have another best of two coming up, though. So don't go too far away. As, uh, we're going to have a little bit of fun in between our best of twos. As a TP He's a cannon. He's a cannon. It's a minion, but it's moving so fast. He gets the kill. Disrespect. Fully dead. Make it two. As Shernfai gets in on the action himself, Dajong is flanking from behind, but he doesn't know where he's going. He needs a nightlight. He's having nightmares. As there's a double kill there for Shernfai. This nocturne with Chaos double digits is an absolute.